special. And now, from Camden Yards, here's John Buren. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Camden Yards on a beautiful April afternoon. It's opening day 1997 for demos. It's going to be the Orioles and the Royals coming up at 3.05 this afternoon. Opening day in Charm City. The uh, starting pitchers, Jimmy Key, put in in place of Mike Musina, is the starter for the Orioles, the left-hander. He will go against Kevin Ape here of the Kansas City Royals. And joining us now, right down here on the field, to start us right off, the lord of the long ball, the skipper of the round tripper. <laughs> Big hand for Boone Powell! Thank you. Yeah! Thank you! Just another outpouring of love <laughs> and support for you, Ben. I love it, buddy. And Man, it's, it's, it's good to see you again. Great to see you. Happy New Year. Thank you. How's Thank the you. product moving up there on the concourse? Everybody's saying there's something new with Boog this yeah. year. You say it's baloney. It's bo no, it's not baloney. It's not baloney. <laughs> it's not baloney. <laughs> no, uh, there was an article in the paper the other day that, that we had ham. I mean, not ham. We have turkey mm -hmm. for the first time ever. But we've had turkey for over a year. So uh, maybe we if everybody thinks that we've got a brand new product that they'll come up there and they'll try our turkey. As a matter of fact, you can smell it right now, can't you? It smells, it's wafting through. But it is wafting through. It's kind through. of wafting. Great I love, word, John. I love it when I like it wafts that. down here. I like that. A lot of storylines going to this opening day, not the least of which, of course, is the move of Cal Ripken Jr. from shortstop taking 30 steps to his right to become the third baseman. That has caused an amazing uproar. What are your thoughts on this? I love it. I think we're going to be better defensively for that move. Uh, the Orioles, Pat and uh, Kevin went out and got the best available shortstop that was around. And uh, I think for anybody less than a guy like Mike Bordick, it might not be the right move. Mm -hmm. But I think it's the right move. I think that we're going to be better off as a team defensively with him at short. Brady Anderson told me uh, about 11.30 this morning he will play. He's going to put the flak jacket on. He will be the designated hitter. Jeffrey Hammonds is going to play in center field. Brady will lead off and be the uh, designated hitter. Black I'm, jacket. This guy's, uh, what is he, think it's <laughs> Superman or something? Well, what are your thoughts on this guy? He played through appendicitis, now he's got a cracked rib. What is he, nuts? Hey, this is a contract year, man. You got to go out there and you got to put those numbers up again. Oh, that's true. It's you know, Hey, man, you got to think about that. Black jacket or broken rib or no broken rib. Let's go out there and get with the program. Uh, I, I'm just kind of interested to see how he's going to swing with this thing on. Or is he going to swing with it on? Yeah. Or is he just going to wear it on the base pads or... Whatever. I, re I remember one year that I was breaking up a double play, and I hit Tony. You were doing what? Breaking up a double play. <laughs> That's when I could get there, John. <laughs> and I hit Tony Kubek, and Tony Kubek hit me in the rib and did a number on my rib, and it made me a better ball player <laughs> because I cut down on my swing. Okay. I was, you know, I, I was I, dying to know where that one was right, going. Right. Well, okay. I, well, I couldn't swing as hard as uh -huh. I normally could, and I'm, I'm kind of sure. I don't know if this is what's going to happen to Brady, but uh, I, I think it'll probably make him a better hitter. Well, let's hope. I Brady's say. crack, incidentally, is on his left side. Yeah, bottom, bottom that's where mine was, too. The extension. Yeah, right. So the you things can't. you guys have in common, it's well, unbelievable. I know, I know. The speed and everything else, <laughs> the arm, <laughs> the whole nine yards. All man. the women and the whole, everything, uh, it's no, unbelievable. No, 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 it's no, no. unbelievable. No, no. All right, me and Boog down here on the field as the Orioles and the Royals go through their uh, pregame regimen. Meanwhile, up in what we like to refer to as the breezeway, Denise Koch and Vic the Hurricane Carter are standing by. Take it away, group. Hey, John. All right, thank you, John. Yay. All right. <laughs> You get, uh, everyone who comes in here gets handed out one of these wonderful banners. You also get one of these baseballs. It's an <laughs> Orioles commemorative baseball with all kinds of facts about the Orioles printed on the side. You have to have a ticket to get those, but that's what you get. Always exciting at the ballpark, but particularly on opening day. And it is an absolutely gorgeous day for baseball. Oh, it's it? fantastic. And as usual, the Orioles have a, a great opening ceremony planned, part of which is a secret. No one will know what's going to happen until the event actually gets underway. We did find out who's throwing out the first pitch. It's Madeline Albright, Secretary of State. Let's hear it we, for the women. Absolutely, and we heard that she had her security details shut off part of the State Department basement so she could practice <laughs> throwing out kidding, the first. Right? I kid you not, this is a true story. <laughs> well, Chris Merritt of the Baltimore Opera Company is also going to be singing the national anthem. He needs no practice. A fantastic internationally known opera star. And also, they're going to have a beautiful red carpet thrown out into the field, mm -hmm. and on either side of the carpet will be these young men and women from yes. the RBI, which is reviving baseball in the inner city. All right! Yeah. Yeah. And here's some of the, the young people here. What, which teams, where do you come from, your different teams? We come from McKinney. And, and where are you located? On Astor Street. And what is your name? Antonio Bird. <laughs> and there are how many teams represented here? Two. Two. The Kims and who else? Doug Gartonville. 
A garden bill, I see. And excuse me, Vic, oh, this is our here. one yes. female on, who that. showed up today to line the carpet. All right, what's your name? Courtney Ely. All right, Courtney, good for you for showing up. So you guys are going to do what? You're going to be on either side of this red carpet. The players run out, and what happens? Shake their hands. You're going to shake their hands? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And what is the purpose of RBI? RBI was started uh, about five years ago in St. Louis, but the purpose of RBI is to establish and reinvent baseball in the inner city. It gives kids that don't have a chance to participate in baseball the chance and the opportunity. All right. And you guys love baseball, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Great thing to do this summer, too. You guys are going to have a wonderful summer. Lots right. of baseball. Now, you're not really going to shake their hands. You're going to... High five. High five them, right? Let's see it. Let's see your high five action. All right. There you right. go. <laughs> okay. All right. So these guys are going to be out there on the field today. Sally and Richard have a beautiful oh, occasion. They're having a wonderful. They're where all the party people the are just before the. Set. Yes, <laughs> so to speak. Yes, Denise, Vic, all of the Orioles fever today is not confined to inside the ballpark. We are outside of Pickles Square, just as inside the colors of the day are black and orange. The Orioles wants everybody to wear them and to wave them. And in fact, Richard, Frank, where's Richard? Where's Richard? I'm right up here, Sal. Yeah, at Pickles, I'm coming out. Right out of, move that pizza, minute. please. Excuse me. Pickles. Come on, guys. Let's go over here. I'm wearing my 90. Come on. Yeah, wearing my, hey, my 98 look. Look at this. Oh, crazy people. A lot of milk here. The Pickles gang. That's right. I'd like you to meet my, uh, I'd like you all to meet Sally. Hi, Sally. Sally. Sally is my better half. I like your shorts, Richard. Thank you. These are my 98 rock. They just came. They had a Sally me on the radio a little while ago, so. I'm reciprocating. Let me plug into you, if I may. Oh, okay, sure. Nothing, be nothing be personal. Oh, okay. All right. There we go. So anyway, what do you guys think? Is this a fabulous day? I was beautiful legal. This is a beautiful day. day. Could have been nicer. Tell us what kind of season this is going to be. It's going to be a championship season with a World ring on the series. finger at the end. World, World Series. Series. World Series. Let's start with today. Are we going to win today? We're going to win today. Score? 11-0. 7 7-4. 4 7-4 Orioles today. Okay. Wait a minute. Guess who I see in the crowd? Wait a second. Oh. Hey, get that off. guy. Richard, you're attached Richard, to me. Richard. You're attached. There's a guy. I can't hey, believe it. It's you. get the guy in the black with the sunglasses, he's the black the shirt, and the sunglasses. I think it's Roberto Alomar. I swear. Well, he's not playing. I know he's not playing. I know he's not playing. Wait a minute. Hurry up. Come here a second. Hey, everybody. I think it's Roberto Alomar. Give him a round of applause. Hey. Hey, hey how are you feeling? Oh, I could use the rest, man. I, I really did. Nice to have you here. It's amazing. Halfway to end the season, man. Yes, it certainly was. You haven't been spitting lately, have you? Uh, not no. lately. Not in front of uh, all the fans. Not in your beers anyway, right? Yeah. Now, what is your name, really? Is this a fabulous Roberto Alomar looking like? Oh, yeah. yeah. oh, my gosh. What's your name? Wenny Del Rosario. What do you do? How do you spell that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> what do you do for a living? Uh, mortgage broker. Really? That's so you have good right? tickets for today? Yeah. All good. Right. Good tickets. Great. You Great. know, Thanks for playing along no with us. Anyway, there are a lot of people. You've got to watch the parking because that is a problem. You know, We're going to be back in a little while to talk about that very thing. We want to hear. Ride the light rail. Right. What? The, Ride the light rail. The ticket. Ride the light rail. It's easy. Uh, Let's right. go back to Bevo on the field and we'll talk about parking when we All right, everybody, back, okay? back to Bevo. One, two, three. Back, back to Bevo! Thanks to one and all up there outside the ball yard. Beautiful day. Where'd Booth. you get the ball, John? This is, uh, here, this is one of the balls like they're going to be using. This being the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking into the big leagues, all the uh, all right. major league ballparks are going to use these uh, special commemorative balls for uh, for opening day. And uh, I wonder if that's going to change the way the ball spins. Probably will. Let's analyze it, shall we? <laughs> okay. But you, you know who the pitcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers was the first day that Jackie Robinson played in the big leagues? Rex Barney. Rex Barney. Right you hey, he goes to the hey, bonus round with number, that one. Number 26. Wasn't that that was his number, too. That was my number, too. And Jackie Robinson started out as a second baseman, Rex I tells me. Started, started out there. Oh, anyway. Rex Barney started out as a second baseman. Did he really? <laughs> no, he did not. Stop that, will you? <laughs> All right, we got some uh, warm-ups going on behind us here as... Uh, there he is, Orioles coach Andy Etchebarren. Let's put Etchebarren on TV. There he is, Dad. Hey, Andy, we're live, baby. We're making you happen. And so, uh, great looking day at the ballpark. We're going to be coming back with more pregame on this opening day, part two. We'll be back to Camden Yards as Gimme and O continues. Special thanks to Boog Powell for coming down, and Jim Hunter will be with us when we come back. Hang around. Baseball, baseball in the
ecstatic Oriole clubhouse. That was back in October. Orioles got to do that drill a couple of times as they made it to the postseason for the first time in 13 years. And, of course, this year, management's thinking bigger and better. Onward and upward, they're talking World Series for this ball club as they made it to the American League Championship Series just last season. Behind me, fellas are going through batting practice, as we said earlier. It's just about a perfect day down here at the ball yard. Makes that decision to back off of yesterday's uh, windy conditions look even better. And joining us now is one of the new additions to the Orioles this year, Jim Hunter, who is going to be the radio voice of the birds on uh, their flagship station. Welcome. Well, how are you? I'm doing fine, Jim. Isn't it amazing how they make you dress for radio here? Yeah. and uh, Classy organization. One thing before. I didn't mention is after the game, Jim's going to be the major day of the Camden Club. So By the way, smoking, know, Jim, smoking, smoking or non-smoking? Smoking or not, okay, just it doesn't go. matter to All me, right. whatever you've got up. Uh, nice job here. Uh, I know you came from CBS Radio. Mm -hmm. What was there about this opportunity? Because for people outside of the business and inside the business, I think there's the perception that, hey, you go to the network, mm -hmm. you know, and you gave up a network yeah, did it backwards, didn't to I? take this gig. What was there that was so well, attractive? I've always wanted to do baseball every day. And even when I went to work at CBS, uh, I got my first uh, assignment with them when I was 23. And I guess what happened was, was you get there and you get ingrained in what you're doing, and every time they give you a new contract, they add duties, and you sort of get settled and you get used to it, and you get used to the routine. But I've always had an eye on going out and, and, and hooking up with a club. And as uh, I did baseball more and more with them uh, on the game of the weekend in the postseason, it's always been something I wanted to do. And when this opportunity was presented to me, when the Orioles called me in December and said, you know, we'd like to talk to you, would you be interested in listening? You know how it is in the business. You always listen. You never know Absolutely. where it's going to lead to. And the more we talked and the more uh, in-depth we got in, in the procedure and the process, uh, I realized that not only uh, was this a dream job, but this was the place to do it. I mean, you have the ballparks always sold out. The team is terrific. The organization is behind the team. And the flagship station, WBAL, is wonderful. So, I mean, all those things came into it. The flagship TV station isn't bad either. That's, that's Channel 13. There you that's go. where you are right now, Hunter. Yeah. And don't you forget it. Right. Hey, all right. Miller uh, is a guy that drew a lot of support from people around here. He was more of an entertainer. Oh, he had that he had that ability to mm -hmm. be an entertainer. I've listened to your call. Good clean call you do what Red Barber used to talk about. Call the ball. Mm -hmm. What's what's your philosophy when you go out there? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? Well, basically, I'm describing what I see for the fans to hear. And even though I I, I don't want people to feel like I'm a stuffed shirt, but at the same time, I, I'm not an entertainer in, in the sense that John was. I, I can't do impressions, you know, all those types of things. I, I try to be lively, and, uh, but I can't force it. You know, if something's there that's uh, humorous, I, I'll mention it. I'll, I'll try to bring some humor into it uh, with my partners in certain situations, but it has to be there. I can't force right. it. And I have to be myself and my style. My father was in the business. He was a producer uh, in New York uh, and, and did Yankee telecasts, and uh, I've learned from the moment I was a little boy Boy, that the game is what is important it's not the fact that you're the one talking about the game and and it's become my style and uh, I realize that the the fans are used to a certain uh, description and presentation and I just have to be myself I, I think I'd be cheating myself and I'd be cheating the fans if I try to turn into an entertainer and uh, if people want to call me nuts and bolts that's fine you don't do impersonations, but can you sing? Because I can feel I got to be me coming on right now. Uh, not, not, I don't want to ruin your ratings. <laughs> All right, look. But I'll get you that table. Okay, good. <laughs> Another thing I've discovered about Jim Jim Hunter, great hair. Does this guy have great hair or what? Yeah, Unbelievable. It's blowing all over the place. I've yeah. been trying to keep right. it in one spot. That's but, great uh, stuff. All right. Well, welcome hey, aboard. Thanks. I've listened to you a couple times spring training. Good, clean call. Thank you very well, much. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep it clean. It's a family show. Have the baseball back is now. that yours? Yeah, it is now. Okay. <laughs> Jim Hunter down here on the field. Let's set up one of the big stories. Did they give you a parking place? Do you have a parking place? Uh, uh, off the record, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's going to be a big, big story, <laughs> not only today, but throughout the rest of the season because of the construction over I've the heard, I've heard. I'm Sally, trying to Richard, stay out of that. Sally and Richard have more on that situation as we send it outside the ball yard. Uh, well, John, it's what everybody's been talking about for days. Parking is the story of the year. And uh, as you said, construction of the new Ravens football. Excuse me. Richard is here uh, with demonstration A. Hi. You found a parking oh, hello, space. officer. Mr. Cher, welcome to Oriole Park at Camden Yard. Oh, thank you, Officer Edger. Thanks. Nice to he see you, sir. Did he wrong, did he? I uh, need to see his license of registration. Oh, sir. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you, sir. You're doing a great job here. One of Baltimore's finest. The problem is, lots D and E are no longer in existence. You can't use those anymore. I can tell you the 2,600 parking spaces that don't exist anymore. So if you're coming down, you can't get a spot like I just got. You if really you can't. You don't have a pass. You have to do MTA, whether it's the park and ride on the bus or the light rail. It's fabulous. Right. Or you great can take any of the express buses from uh, right from those places, or you can you can take the Mark train. Well, if you haven't gotten on the Mark train right now, you're probably history. And from the looks 
uh, a lot of these fans um, in front of Pickles, it's probably just as well that they're not going to be driving home today. That is right. We have the two the most... Littlest fan. Littlest fan. This is today's littlest fan. What is your name? Ida Heck. And what is your sister's name? <laughs> Caitlin. Is she your daughter? Yes, yeah, she is. Tell us about Caitlin. She's, most She's nine months old, Frank, and this will be her second time. Orioles game. Really? She came last season when she was three months old. Where did she park? Right across the street at the gas station. We have reservations. Oh, and nicely Caitlin, done. Uh -huh. Caitlin, your favorite TV station is WJZ. Very good. <laughs> Very good, Caitlin. Where was that other baby? There was another pretty baby here. Is this the only pretty baby in the crowd? Have fun today. Bye. All right, well, anyway, that's the scoop. We're here at Pickles Pub. And, Frank, if you take a look out there, you can see there are literally thousands of people here who don't have tickets but are having a wonderful time. 98 Rock is over on the other side. And you've got sliders down the other corner at Camden's Cafe. And we're just having such a great time All here. right, let's go back to John in the ballpark. Bye-bye. All, right, All right, we're just about 40 minutes to the start of today's season. Open the Orioles and the Kansas City Royals. We're going to be back with more of Gimme an O as we continue down here at the ball yard. Infield going on behind me. New Orioles shortstop Mike Bordick, who, because we're on him, probably won't do anything now for a couple of minutes. But there he is. The new shortstop taking over from Cal Ripken Jr. Stay with us. Opening day is right around the corner. I had a plan with a big baseball player back in high school. He can throw that speed. Take me out to the ball game. Take oh, me out. Out to the ball game. Welcome back to Gimme and O. We're counting it down to opening day for the 97 Orioles. Got the Kansas City Royals in town. We're coming up on a 3.05 start time. Picture perfect day. I mean, it's getting up near 70. This is living right and living large. And, uh, you know, as much a part of uh, this whole experience as baseball is, baseball in the sunshine, you can't do it without a hot dog, without some Cracker Jacks. Buy me a peanut and Cracker Jacks. Well, with more on the food angle to all this, Let's send it up to Denise Coke and Hurricane Carter, who are probably up there stuffing their faces right no, about no, now. No, no, no. Vic had a hot dog. I, I haven't had anything yet. Yes, I had a hot dog. It was a large hot dog, John. It certainly was. It was huge. <laughs> it certainly was. Do they even sell Cracker Jacks here? I don't think I, so. You know, I don't know. I I've don't know. I've never had them at a ballpark. Well, but we'll go in and check that out. <laughs> By the way, Aramark is the company that provides all the concessions here at the ballpark. And believe me, they got their work cut out for them. They will be serving up. 18,000 hot dogs. That's just for today. You ate one of them. I had one of them. So <laughs> it's uh, uh, 17,999. 6,000 orders of french fries, 700 pounds of popcorn, 4,000 gallons of soda, 80,000 ice cubes. How'd you like to have the job counting those? Huh? <laughs> and for those of you who less, enjoy less traditional food at the ballpark, they've always got the Maryland crab cakes and a new item. We've got the inside scoop on this. The new, new item on the menu, hot wings. Hot wings? Hot wings here at the ballpark. That's it's going to be messy, messy in the stands. That's what, exactly what I thought. It's a little messy. Well, there's another little tidbit I've been elected to tell you about. Not that I'm bitter, but they had a survey uh, amongst a, at a dating service amongst women uh, about who are the sexiest players. We had this on the news a while. If you didn't hear it, the sexiest Oriole player, according to these women who were polled, Brady Anderson. Must be the sideburns. Must be the, uh, the way he uh, stands at bat must be his sort of James Dean image, I guess. He's very, you, you there's no question. You don't agree with this? Oh, he's very pretty, there's no question. There are lots of lovely players, and they look so snug in their uniforms. Uh, after Brady came uh, pitchers Rocky Coppinger, then Scott Erickson, then Mike Mussina, and we can't forget outfielder Tony Tarasco. Rafael Palmero did not make the list. I we, was not pulled. I think we need to check into this for your benefit. Yeah. We'll see what's happening. He's such a nice fellow, Raphael. Martin. They had written in so the I've script that we should toss to our sexiest man on the ball field, John Buren. Who wrote that? I don't know, but we're not going to say that. Let's just go back to Josh. All right, thank you, Vic and Denise, and uh, nice try, Vic. I appreciate you pitching for me, babe. <laughs> a couple of new attractions down here at the ballpark this year. Well, first of all, I've got some new Hawaiian shirts, but we'll get to that later. Paying customers at Camden Yards this year will be able to determine by simply glancing out toward the outfield exactly how fast the pitch they have just seen was thrown. They've got this new radar gun contraption, and uh, you'll know exactly how fast Mike Mussina is throwing it, and it'll be interesting to see throughout the year who can gas it up the highest. You know, you get in the mid-90s, you're doing big damage these days, and uh, that'll be one of the new attractions. Also, the Orioles have figured out a way to make even more money, more money, more money. Those signs that you see, the sponsorship signs out there by the bullpen, 
will now be a tri-vision setup. Uh, that means that they're, they're, there's really three signs out there, and they'll roll over and rotate between innings so the Orioles can hit up three sponsors instead of just one. And uh, some of the teams that will be coming in this year for the first time in the history of the Baltimore Orioles are going to be National League teams because of this interleague scheduling that they've got. The Orioles will play the uh, National League Eastern Division teams, and the ball clubs that will be coming in here to Camden Yards will be the Expos, the Mets, and the Phillies. So it will be fun to see that happen. That Philadelphia rivalry would seem to be a natural with the uh, Phillies just 90 miles up the road. Batting practice continues behind me as uh, the Orioles are getting ready for this 3:05 start. We're counting it down to opening day here on Channel 13. Stay with us. We'll be back at the ball yard as Gibby and O continues. Kind of laid back, ain't much an old country ball like me can't hack. Early to rise, early in the sack. I thank God I'm a country boy. Well, a simple kind of life never did me no harm. Raising me a family and working on the farm. Leaves of green, red roses too. All right, back at the ballpark. We're counting down to opening day on a beautiful day, courtesy of... Thank you, Doug. Oh, Bob. Bob gave us a good day. Got the easiest job here today. Isn't this take, something? Take a look at this forecast. It's just beautiful out here. Game time pitching around 64 degrees, a breeze out of the northwest, 10 to 12, something like that, maybe 14, dry sunny put the sunscreen on you're gonna need it i'm telling you unbelievable beautiful thanks day. uncle bob for such a beautiful day enjoy That's the game it for you know. more pregame coming your way enjoy the ball game coming up in about 35 minutes see ya and subway lines as well as four major highways it blends in with the urban context of downtown baltimore while taking its image from baseball parks built in the early 20th century 432 feet from home plate and located beyond right field stands the b&o warehouse nearly 100 years old this landmark is still the longest building this side of mississippi today this beautiful baseball facility known as canvin yards will host its sixth opening day and chris hoyles has been here for everyone uh, Camden Yards is a very special place uh, to play, and, and uh, you know it's been a place that's been very good to me, numbers-wise. And uh, but I think any time you have a chance to put on a uniform and play at this level and uh, uh, contribute at this level, it's it's, uh, it's just a blessing. Camden Yards is a stage for many to see their hometown heroes, and those young and old will develop new idols like newcomer Mike Borden. No, I, I, I like going into the Oriole Park there, and I think it's a great atmosphere. I think the fans are very knowledgeable, and that makes it that much more exciting. The park itself is beautiful. Probably the, probably the most exciting and comfortable place to play, I think, play the game of baseball today. Rehearsals are over now as the boys of summer are back here at Camden Yards, where one-time rivals and now current Orioles believe there's no better place to be on opening day. And no player don't want to play in front of a packed house. You know, if you can't get motivated for that, you shouldn't be playing. So roll out the red carpet as the Orioles and the Royals celebrate one of sports' finest moments. And once again this year, the Orioles Television Network will bring you all the action. The Orioles Television Network presents Major League Baseball. Today, live from Camden Yards, it's the Baltimore Orioles versus the Kansas City Royals. Well, the seats here at Camden Yards are being filled as we speak. Beautiful day for baseball. Much more fan and player friendly. Yesterday, the winds gusting from 30 to 40 miles per hour. Temperatures expected late in the day to fall into the 20s. Today, a little bit different. Temperatures in the 60s and just a great day to start the 1997 baseball season. Hi everybody, I'm Jim Palmer, Mike Regai, who normally uh, would be here today, he's on assignment. And uh, as I have over the last couple of years, it's a great honor to work with Mike Flanagan. I, uh, Mike, as we look at the 1997 version of the Orioles, you were there all spring. Uh, they had a great spring training, 18 and 12. Most people think 
that they're going to be a better team this year. Well, I think they are, too. I think what they realized last season, they hit the 257 home runs, but sort of could not manufacture the little runs and things you need to do to win in postseason play. So they went out, tried to prove the de improve the defense, tried to improve the starting pitching, and they feel the bullpen has a year more experience. So they feel if you add those three things together, they got a better club. Well, I think the question, and uh, Davey Johnson addressed this in spring training, I said, you know, you're a National League manager. You like to see that mobile shortstop, and they have that in Mike Portick coming over from Oakland A's. Can you win in the Arena Baseball League, the American League, with better defense and maybe give up some of that power? Well, I think you have to. I think, you know, they set a, a career high or a team high with ERA, the 514 last year. They said, you got to fix that. We'll have better infield defense, better outfield defense. Let's play some three to two ball games. Okay, we have a couple of newcomers we'll see in the lineup. Uh, Eric Davis will play right field. Mike Porter will play shortstop. And a guy that nobody expected to play today, Brady Anderson. Well, Brady, you know, you never know with Brady after the uh, appendectomy last year that never happened. Said he wants to play. He's in the lineup. I think they are concerned. He's going to be wearing a flat jacket under his uniform, and we'll see what he does. I think today is a great barometer to see what Brady can do. Well, we're looking forward to him. We will be back after these commercial uh, messages with our opening day festivities. Jim Palmer and Mike Flanagan back at Camden Yard as we await for the opening festi festivities. And uh, Mike, uh, one of the newcomers that we didn't talk about in the opening is the guy that's going to pitch today, Jimmy Key. He's uh, had great success on opening day, 6-0. and oh, And uh, what's he going to bring to the Orioles? Well, I, you know, for me, he's always been a big game pitcher. We were teammates up in Toronto. We, as you said, he has six straight uh, opening day victories, three with Toronto, three with New York. Also World Series experience. He's just a terrific leader type of guy that uh, along with Mike Messina gives you almost two number one pitchers well you can have that and what they do for me is they both can control the running game and you hope they pitch 250 innings apiece and you take 500 innings off the uh, the log book now let's go to an interview that uh, you did with Jimmy Key talking about his goals for 1997 the only goal I try to set is 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 pitch six innings every time I go out on the mound I, I, that's a realistic goal I think any starter should be able to achieve if he's uh, you know, healthy and, and can do that. And I feel like if I'm on the field for six innings and, you know, I'm keeping my team in the game and anything above six innings is a plus. So uh, that's realistically, that's the only goal I try to set. I don't look at numbers as far as uh, wins or losses or ERA or stuff like that. I've, I've never done that. And, and to me, if you're on the field consistently, like I said, six innings a game, uh, your numbers will take care of themselves. And for Jimmy Key, last year with the Yankees, as you mentioned, uh, winning the playoffs in the American League Championship Series and then won the clincher as the Yankees came from uh, a 2 nothing deficit to win the World Series four in a row over the Atlanta Braves. Last year, Jimmy Key's record 12 and 11, 5 and 6 with an ERA of over five runs a game early in the year. But uh, Mike pitched very well the second half. As a matter of fact, went nine, well, seven and five in the in the second half but nine and five over his last 14 decisions well he just he felt he, he came off some rotator cuff surgery and just felt that his arm finally responded and he said actually this spring it hasn't felt this good in four or five <laughs> seasons so look out to american league you would think he'd be if he's healthy and uh, of course that's one of the goals he talked about the perfect guy to pitch here in camden yards well yeah a sinker ball pitcher changes speeds a veteran type pitcher you know brings leadership to the rest and i think that's another thing that Maybe the trade-off with David Wells for Jimmy Key is that's the difference. That Jimmy a sinker ball and David more of a high fastball pitcher. What will Jimmy Key, with all that experience, bring to the Oriole pitching staff? Hopefully, the intellectual side of pitching. He's definitely not a thrower. You know, he's someone the other pitchers can watch and learn something from. And now let's go to Rex Barney here at Camden Yards. We hope you have a wonderful time today, and we remind you to see your usher if you need any assistance. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for our opening day ceremonies and here to get the much anticipated 1997 season underway is the Hall of Fame voice of the Orioles, Chuck Thompson. Okay. Thank you very much, Rex. Very good to hear your voice again and it's good to be back at Oriole Park. Hello everyone. Welcome to the sixth opening day here at Oriole Park. We trust that you had a fine winter and hope that you'll share our anticipation and excitement surrounding this year's Orioles team. Soon we will introduce the new and improved birds. A few changes were made in the offseason, but overall, 
this is that same group of people that had us all on the edge of our seats last October. However, before we bring those people out, it is only fitting that we take a moment to acknowledge two very important celebrations we will be observing in 1997. First is an anniversary that Major League Baseball has dedicated our season to. This anniversary reminds us that barriers can be overcome. In 1947, a young man named Jackie Robinson first stepped foot on a Major League diamond. The message this brave man sent to the world was that no matter how significant an obstacle may be, there is no barrier that human spirit cannot overcome. This year, as Baseball World celebrates the 50th anniversary of this remarkable achievement, the Orioles will honor the feat in two ways. The first will be in the form of a patch worn on the sleeve of the Orioles uniform. It will serve as a reminder to all who see it that through dedication, hard work, and courage, all barriers can be overcome. And now, for the unveiling of another Jackie Robinson reminder, with the help of a little leaguer from the Orioles RBI Baseball League. This on-deck circle will serve as a reminder of this very special and important accomplishment throughout the baseball season. Another milestone that we would like to observe during this season is the 200th birthday of this wonderful city of ours, Baltimore. To celebrate this birthday, our Orioles will wear a handsome bicentennial patch on their sleeve. Also, in order to commemorate our, our city's 200th birthday and to remind all of our Oriole Park visitors of this celebration, let's bring out the Honorable Mayor of Baltimore, Mayor Kurt Schmoke, for a very special unveiling. Okay, Mr. Mayor, you go right ahead and do the honors of unveiling the home on deck circle which will truly commemorate our home, the city of Baltimore, and its wonderful tradition of 200 years. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you fans in advance for your support of both of these very special celebrations, which we will be commemorating throughout the 97 baseball season. Okay, now it's on to the matter at hand, and to help us with today's player introductions is a gentleman that I'm very happy to welcome to our Orioles fan. You know, in all of my years here behind the microphone, I have worked with many quality people, and I'm happy to say that this gentleman fits into that same mold. I spent many happy years working with his dad on CBS football, and now, ladies and gentlemen, a great deal of pleasure to welcome Mr. Jim Hunter from WBAL Radio. Jim. Thank you very much, Chuck. Before I get started, I'd like to thank all of you fans for making me feel welcome here in Baltimore. My wife, Bonnie, my children, Jimmy, Jeffrey, and Allison are all here today, and we really feel part of this community. I'd also like to thank Mr. Angelos and the Orioles organization and WBAL Radio as well for making all this possible. I'm looking forward to a great year and a long tenure here in Baltimore. Before we get on to introducing the players, I'd like to recognize Chuck and my partner, Fred Mafros, up in the radio booth holding court. Fred. And now to get things going, we're going to introduce the players, and Chuck will start with the visitors from Kansas City. Thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, it's time now to introduce today's opponents, the Kansas City Royals. And first of all, the trainers, Nick Swartz and Steve Morrow. Strength and conditioning coordinator, Kevin Barr. Next, the third base coach, 
former Orioles second baseman, number 40, Richie Dollar. Welcome back, Rich. The bullpen coach, number 55, Guy Hansen. Pitching coach, number 54, Bruce Keeson. The hitting coach, number 19, Greg Luzinski. And the first base coach, number 39, Mitchell Page. And the bench coach, another former Oriole catcher, number nine, Jamie Quirk. And the bullpen catcher, who is strangely enough in the bullpen, number 62, Roman Rodriguez. And now shortstop, number six, David Howard. Catcher, number 15, Mike McFarland. Infielder, uh, catcher number 15, excuse me. Infielder number 16 is Scott Cooper. Outfielder, number 18, Johnny Damon. Right-handed pitcher, number 21, Jeff Montgomery. Right-handed pitcher, number 25, Jamie Bluma. Catcher, number 29, Mike Sweeney. Left-handed pitcher, number 33, Chris Haney, the son of an Oriole catcher. Num the right-handed pitcher, number 35, Ippolito Pichardo. And right-handed pitcher, number 41, Tim Melcher. Designated hitter, number 44, Chili Davis. Left-handed pitcher, number 45, Jason Hockamy. Right-handed pitcher, number 47, Brian Bevel. Left-handed pitcher, number 50, Jose Rosado. Right-handed pitcher, number 51, Randy Veras. Left-handed pitcher, number 53, Glendon Rush. Left-handed pitcher, number 57, Jamie Walker. And now the starting lineups. First, the manager, number eight, Bob Boone. Batting first and playing second base, number 30, Jose Offerman. Batting second and playing center field, number 42, Tom Goodwin. Batting third and playing left field, number one, Bip Roberts. Batting fourth and playing first base, number seven, Jeff King. Batting fifth and playing shortstop, number 28, Jay Bell. Batting sixth, the designated hitter, number 32, Joe Vitiello. Batting seventh and playing right field, number 24, Jermaine Dye. Batting eighth, the third baseman, number 12, Craig Paquette. Batting ninth, the catcher, number two, Tim Spear. And pitching for the Royals, right-hander, number 17, Kevin Apier. Jim, it's about time to go to work now. Now it's time, Chuck, to introduce the 1997 Baltimore Orioles. Let's start things off by introducing a few people who are very vital to the success of the ball club. And first, our fine feathered friend, here he is, Dick Down Tails, the bird. Next, the guy who keeps the field looking oh so beautiful, and isn't it beautiful today? Please welcome the head grounds creepy, Paul Swaska. This next gentleman hasn't missed a game since opening day 1960. And he's appearing now in his 2,915th consecutive game. Let's say hello to the real Iron Man, field attendant Ernie Tyler.
Next are Mr. Tyler's sons, who are also longtime Orioles, serving as the Orioles clubhouse manager and visiting clubhouse manager. Let's say hello to Jim and Fred Tyler. Up next is Orioles bat boy, Sean King. The Orioles clubhouse attendants, Buddy German and Butch Burnett. Two men that work awfully hard over the course of the year, the head trainer, Richie Mansells. And the assistant trainer, Brian Ebel. Here's Orioles strength and conditioning coach, Tim Bishop. The Orioles bullpen catcher, number 54, Sam Snyder. And now the Orioles coaching staff. First up, the hitting coach, number 48, Rick Down. The bench coach, former catcher, number 13, Andy Echenaren. The pitching coach, and welcome back to Baltimore, number 31, Ray Miller, who's in the bullpen. The third base coach, number two, Sam Perlazzo. The first base coach, number 18, John Stearns. And last, but certainly not least, opening the season in Orioles uniform now for a club record 29th time, the bullpen coach, number 44, Elrod Hendricks. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce the 1997 Orioles. And here to give us some assistance in the introductions, 100 Little Leaguers from Hartford County and the Orioles RBI League. Come on out, guys. Let's give a Baltimore welcome to 
to number 30, Scott Kamenicki. Also new to the team, right-handed pitcher, number 32, Sean Bosky. Right-handed pitcher, number 35, Mike Messina. Just 21 years old. Here he is, number 39, Mike Jackson. Catcher, number 42, Lenny Webster. Left handed pitcher, number 47, Jesse Orozco. Number 49, Armando Benitez. Right-handed pitcher, number 51, Terry Matthews. Left-handed pitcher, number 53, Arthur Rhodes. Ladies and gentlemen, last year's highlights included a 50 home run season by Brady Anderson, 
142 RBIs by most valuable Oriole, Rafael Palmero. The return of playoff baseball to Baltimore and over 3.6 million fans here at Camden Yards to see it all. Now, 1997 holds many of those same fortunes, and with additions like Eric Davis, Mike Bordick, and Jimmy Key, expectations are higher than ever, and the Orioles want to thank all you fans for all your support in advance for what hopes to be a wonderful season. Now, of course, the team is not complete without the best fans in baseball, and representing you, the fans, today is the 10th man, a youngster today randomly selected from the stands before the game. Ladies and gentlemen, in honor of every fan that comes through the turnstile that will see a game live at Oriole Park and every fan that will tune in on the radio or watch TV, please welcome to the Orioles the 10th man. Here he is, 10-year-old Jordan Messer from Columbia, Maryland. time for our ceremonial first pitch and doing the honors today is someone we are very honored to have with us here in Baltimore ladies and gentlemen please welcome the Secretary of State of the United States of America Madeline Albright and we'll be back with the starting lineups for the Royals and the Orioles after these commercial words. Well, let's take a look at the Kansas City Royals the lineup. Blue Cross Blue Shield lineup. For the Royals, Jose Offerman will lead it off, playing second base, new position for him. Tom Goodwin, second to Kenny Lofton, stolen bases, will play center field. Pip Roberts, uh, hamstring problems last year. He'll be the third hitter in left field. Jeff King, with 30 home runs, comes over from Pittsburgh. Bonafide slugger in the fourth spot, Jay Bell. Some power at shortstop, excellent fielder. Led the National League in fielding at shortstop, will hit fifth. Joe Vidiella, great spring, five home runs will be the DH today. Jermaine Dye acquired uh, just last week from the Atlanta Braves. He'll play right field. Boy, can he throw. He'll be the seventh hitter. Craig Paquette, who led the Royals with home runs with 22, will hit eighth and play third base. And Tim Spear, uh, will once again a late acquisition uh, from the Royals, uh, come being picked up by the Red Sox, will catch today. And on the mound, Look at 29-year-old Kevin Apier. Well, you can see there, sixth opening day start. Most in the club history, career bets, 207 starts last year. Great batting average uh, against. One of the best pitchers, certainly, in the league. First round draft pick in 87, 14-11 last year. ERA champ in 93, bona fide opening day starter. Your number one guy. 
And he will face the, the Oriole lineup. Again, the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, starting lineup for the Orioles. Brady Anderson. Surprise, surprise. He'll DH. Would normally be playing center. He'll hit first. Mike Bordick will play shortstop and hit in the second spot. Rafael Palmero with 22 RBIs this spring will hit third. At first base, Eric Davis. A great spring will be the right fielder. Outstanding defensive player. Hitting fifth will be Cal Ripken. He moves over about 30, 40 feet from shortstop to third base where he played very well this spring. B.J. Surhoff will be the left fielder. He'll hit in the sixth spot. Jeffrey Hammonds having a great spring. And 21 RBIs right behind Palmero will play center field because of the rib injury to Brady Anderson. Catching and hitting eighth, Chris Hoyles. And Jeff Re Rebele, who will be the utility man. Uh, he will be the second baseman until Robbie Alomar returns from the five-day suspension. And on the mound, left-hander, he'll uh, turn 36 in about two weeks, Jimmy Key. Yeah, six foot one, 200 pounds, 164 wins. You see that ninth among active pitchers. Great winning percentage, seven. Career at Camden Yards, four and one. He's what you'd call a, a money or big game pitcher. Six and oh in opening day appearances, and uh, he's the complete package. And 12 and six lifetime against the Royals. We'll be back after these words. A new feature on O's TV here in 1997, the Ford Motor Company keys to the game. Well, the way we see it, Kevin Apier must contain the left-handers, the toughest right-handed pitcher on right-handed hitters in the league. They hit just 228. Three left-handers in the lineup, Anderson, Paul Merrill, and Serhap must have good days. And for the Orioles, the key to opening day will be Jimmy Key. Three and three uh, World Series wins against Toronto. Three or opening day wins against New York. Just a terrific pitcher. Kansas City, fastest team in the league. First in steals. Key the best at stopping them or preventing the steal. And here's the first pitch of the ball game. Jose Offerman takes high. Offerman a switch hitter. One thing about Jimmy Creek Key, always very aggressive. It's one of the best game day preparations I've ever seen. Just comes in, said, I'm coming right at the hitters today. I don't know what's going to happen. I can't predict the future, but I'm going to be aggressive in the strike zone. And there he is. One ball and two strikes as he hits the outside corner. No, not overpowering. Probably throws, what, 86, 87 miles per hour, Mike? Well, his uh, goal or his intent on pitching is just to stretch the outside corner. See how far he can move that out. Line drive right center field. Hammonds with a good jump and makes a nice grab. Fighting the sun all the way. And today's umpires behind home plate. The crew chief, Don Gettinger. John Shulock down at first. Rick Reed at second. Tim Sheeta will do the umpiring at third. That was a, sort of a scary play for the first play of the game. Reminded me a lot of Jeffrey Hammond's slide last August. 15th when he hurt his knee. I think the key for Jeffrey just continue what he did in spring training and stay healthy. Great spring as Tom Goodwin takes high ball one. Line drive slashed into left field. Sir Hoff right there playing shallow two down here in the top of the first inning. B.J. Surhoff, who played a lot of third base last season, sort of penciled in as uh, the most regular left fielder this season. Davey said he'll do some DHing also. And that'll bring up the third place hitter, Bip Roberts. A lot of speed at the top of the lineup. Bouncer to Palmero, arguably the best. American League infield, Paul Merrill hands it easy, and Key has a 1-2-3 inning. No score here at Camden Yards. Nobody does it like you, the way that you do. Nobody's got the power to please me. Hoover's exclusive two-tank system lets you pick up wet in one tank, then switch to a separate tank to pick up dry. So there's no mess emptying, wet or dry. Nobody does it like you, Hoover, nobody does 
Disappear just as quickly. Offer begins April 4th. It's ironic, you know, that parents are so good about bringing their kids in to see me, but never see a doctor regularly themselves, especially the fathers. And when I do see them and something is wrong, all I can think is that I could have helped even sooner. My concern, that's doing something for your kids. Whatever your insurance, Call 529-2900 for an appointment right away with a Helix doctor near you. Today's giant HTS Orioles Million Dollar Magic contestant is Judy Smith. Judy has automatically won a Sony 27-inch stereo television. And if an Orioles player hits for the cycle in today's game, Judy wins $1 million. So turn your field of dreams into a field of green by playing Giants HTS Orioles Million Dollar Magic. See your local giant for details. Well, the wind blowing from, uh, actually, it seemed like uh, down in the cage, <laughs> blowing in. Well, it's blowing it is. all over the place. A lot less than yesterday. <laughs> Those flags were stretched out yesterday. Kevin Apier, you really hit it right on the head, Flanning, when you said this guy is a number one opening day pitcher. Yeah, and he keeps drawing the Orioles. I think it's a fourth consecutive year he's done that. A very, very deceptive windup. Bruce Keeson, the pitching coach of Kansas City, saying, you know, he, he's all over the place, but, uh, you, you know, good velocity, good movement, usually very, very good location. And uh, well, I was talking to Rick Down before the game. He said, you cannot swing at his delivery because he's very herky jerky. Shoulder almost goes straight up in the air, really defies a lot of the. Uh, pitching mechanic uh, features I guess you're supposed to have but it makes for a very deceptive delivery when push comes to shove and he's ready to let the ball go everything does finally end up okay well there are the numbers for Brady in 96 50 home runs and he swings at the first pitch and all eyes will be on his rib cage we were even watching him as he ran in during the opening festivities he has a uh, flak jacket that is uh, actually taped with an ace bandage around the rib area. I figure hitting will be the most difficult thing. That twisting of the center of the torso. The one strike pitch to Brady. A little bit outside, one and one. I talked to him, I said, you know, do you ever have a sore arm? He said, oh yeah. And I said, well, that's the only thing I could really relate to. I, and, but he said it's more like a dull ache. And he said, you can tap him on the, the other side of his body and it'll still affect his ribs. Pulled foul. One ball and two strikes. I think Rick Down said that I think what they're concerned most about is how is he going to react to a swing and a miss? Because, you know, Brady does not miss too often in batting practice. In fact, nobody does. Yeah, I think mean, it's like prize fighters, the same thing. When they swing and hit contact, it's okay. It's that <laughs> swing and a miss. It really stretches that, uh, that area. One two pitch to Brady. And there is the splitter. And he stays alive. Well, that's the pitch Rick Downs says they have to lay off. If it's up, it's okay. But the one in the dirt, usually his strikeout pitch. So he struck out over 200 last season. Tries to get you to expand the strike zone. Above average slider. Well, he was fifth in the American League in earned run average, eighth in complete games, third in the league with 207 strikeouts. Second as far as strikeouts per nine innings with 8.8. .8. And Brady, 22 times last year, hit by a pitch. Picks up where he left off. As if he needs another ache. Do I know when my toe hurts? If I bang my finger with a hammer, I forget about my toe. <laughs> so maybe this will work. I think it just gets him on with some of the little finger. As he chokes up a little bit. No, I'm on the left hand. You see here, he's right on the plate and really does not move those feet at all. I don't know how much running he'll be able to do in spring training before the injury stole six without being caught. Mike Bordick at the plate, and he fouls off the first pitch. 
Burdick a 264 hitter this spring with four RBIs. The guy that Davey Johnson, manager of the Orioles, talked about uh, having the ability to hit the ball the other way. That's why he has him in the second spot. Usually, uh, well, this is a spot where Alomar usually hits or will hit. And try to shoot that ball, take advantage of the first baseman holding the runner on. 0 1 pitch. Slider catches the outside corner 0 and 2. Bordick just 7 for 33 lie time against Kevin Apier, 212. Really uh, only one home run in this entire starting lineup against Kevin Apier. Alomar has one. And Paul Merrill has one. And he is down on strikes. And a pretty good idea of how tough Apier is against right handers last year. The league only hit 220. The lefties better come to the rescue. Yes, they so at least on, have a chance. Take another look. That herky jerky delivery. As Bordick out in front just tips the end of the bat. It's a great camera shot. Well, you know, Bruce Keeson, the pitching coach, said that most guys, they get on top of that slider and pull across. He said, but he kind of throws two. He gets underneath it, and it almost backs up. So you think that maybe it's going to break down in a way, and yet it just kind of falls towards you if you're a right-handed batter. Well, I think it would be almost impossible to teach this delivery. It certainly works for Apier. Palomero fouls away the first pitch. So Kevin Apier quickly... In front of Raphael. Usually, as a hitter or a pitcher, you try to keep your shoulders parallel to the ground and a straight line to the plate. And Apier throws his front shoulder straight up in the air and then peels off towards first and somehow gets his arm in a pretty good throwing position. And Paul Merrill, the only hitter in the order lineup that does have a home run off Apier. Paul Merrill, nine for 44 in his career. 204 shows you the kind of pitcher Apier is. And Raphael having a great spring. Led all American leaguers with 22 RBIs. Jeffrey Hammond's just one behind him. Doesn't get the call on a breaking ball just off the outside corner. One ball and one strike. Well, Rick Down was saying that, you know, what he has to guard against with Rafi is trying to outdo the 142 RBIs of last year. You know, let's just stay on that same pace. 142 is pretty good. You know, don't, don't try to drive it 200. So. You know, I mean, not over swing. Be patient like he was last year. And he fouls it down the left field line. Oh, 142 RBI is the all-time Oriole record. Uh, broke Jim Gentile's record, of, at least previous record, of 141. Well, only stood for 36 years. I think it was in 61, wasn't it? Yeah, 1961. Yeah. 289 batting average, 39 home runs. Got on base about 38% of the time, walked 95 times, so he was patient. Splitter foul. Again, one ball and two strikes, one out. Bottom of the first, no score here at Camden Yards. I think that's also impressive about Palmero. In the 90s, he is second in games played to guess who? Rip has played 1,066 and Palmero 1,048. Davey is saying, and I really don't need a lot of utility infielders in this infield. They average about 159 games apiece. Perfect pitch. Belt high inside. Strikeout number two for Kevin Apier. Plenty of it. It's a little easier when you get ahead, isn't it? <laughs> and then locate the pitcher on the inside <laughs> black. I mean, that's uh, pretty impressive so far. I suppose you're usually a straight line to the plate. You see the man slightly open, and that right leg curls all the way over towards first. And that'll bring up Eric Davis, his first at bat here in an Oriole uniform. Coming off a very good spring at 313. Three home runs, 10 RBIs. Made some marvelous plays in the outfield. He can cover some ground. Great throwing arm. Could easily be a, uh, as he has been most of his career, a center fielder. But 115 games in center field last season. But this is not a comfortable at bat in your first at bat with the Orioles against a guy like Apier. And we don't know if their paths have crossed maybe in spring training at some time, but 
and it's pretty tough. You have to go off to off of a scouting report. Back up slider. So Apier strikes out the side after hitting Brady Anderson with a pitch, and at the end of one uh, inning of play, no score from Camden Yards. is tomorrow night. Come see the O's take on the Kansas City Royals under the lights at 735. Good tickets are available at the Orioles box office. All Ticketmaster locations are by calling 4108-481 seat or 202-432 seat. And also if you're in Virginia, that number on your screen. Jeff King wanted some power, went over the National League with the Pirates had got it, hit 30 home runs last year. And he takes ball one high from Jimmy Key. He was over there with Ray Miller and Jimmy Leland with the Pirates. 1-0 pitch. Sinker outside corner one and one. Well, King came up as a third baseman. Uh, I remember talking to Jim Leland saying that, uh, him saying that, uh, you know, if he could ever be as good as I think he's going to be, he's going to be a terrific player. And he had that kind of year last year. 18 home runs two years ago. Last year turned it up and hit 30. We hit nine last April. Got off to a great start. Tied the National League lead with grand slams with three. He stole 15 bases. Has a little bit of speed. He'll play first base for the Royals. 2-2 two -two to Jeff King. No, not a real big guy. I asked Greg Rolizinski, the hitting instructor, said, you know, how do he hit 30 home runs? He said he's a pull hitter. He hit most of his home runs from left center over. Change up a little low, full count. Three and two. Top of the second inning. There's the bull. Yeah, we had his son in camp. He's a catcher, acquired from the LA Dodgers. Ryan Lazinski. Greg Lazinski with 307 lifetime home runs. Good fastball running away for Jimmy Key's first strikeout. One of the new features on at uh, Camden Yards is a radar gun and and what the pitch is, and I said it's an 87 mile an hour fastball, but what it is is great location. Low and away on the black, right to Chris Hoyles' glove. That's really what pitching's all about. You get three and two, a lot of guys will give in, but Key still able to make that quality pitch. He'll face Jay Bell. He really had a terrific spring, Jimmy Key did that, is uh, his first four or five starts. Then he went through one stretch where he sort of went through the dead arm period. Changed a little bit in his stride. Landing a little closed on his body. That landing foot or right foot closed off or turned towards first base a little too much and locked his delivery out from being able to throw strikes. His best pitches were running off the outside corner instead of hitting it. Sinker hit the shortstop. 40 quickly over to Palmero and there are two outs. Always nice to come over, take uh, the place of a guy that's going to the Hall of Fame at shortstop and make the first play. Well, he may be the right guy, though, to replace uh, someone like Hal. Mike, very businesslike between the uh, the lines. So again, a two quick outs here in the second inning, and that will bring up Joe Vitiello. Tell you, if Cy is guaranteed having a good year, this guy is going to be about a 300 hitter with 30 home runs. Well, it worked in the spring. You saw the numbers right there, 455. He had three home runs in his first 10 at bats in spring training. Bob Boone uh, talking about the fact that Bob Hamlin, who was rookie of the year about three years ago, he and Vidiello were trying to vie for the DH job. Hamlin had had uh, eye surgery, had that laser surgery to improve his vision. Had a pretty good spring, but. Vidiello had even a better one. One ball and two strikes. Jimmy Keith doing what he does so well, getting out in front of the hitters, keeping the ball down. Good guy to play defense behind. Well, oh, this infield, you're crazy not to keep the ball down and have him roll over, Mike. The whole premise is why. Uh, you know, have him hit the ball on the ground. It's hard to hit ground ball homers. Two balls and two strikes. 
and got a hit one and two came up and in. I assume Mike this pitch will be something out on right on the outside corner if he can get it there. And he does with a changeup. So two strikeouts for Jimmy Key. One, two, three, six now in a row for Key. We'll go to the bottom of the second inning. Make your plans now to be at Camping Yards for Magnet Schedule Night. That's uh, Friday, April 11th. All fans attending the 735 O's Rangers contest will receive a 1997 free Orioles Magnet Schedule courtesy of Southwest Airlines. Get your tickets at the Orioles op uh, box office or any Ticketmaster or call the numbers on your screen. And remember, Orioles baseball, there's nothing like a day or night here at the yard. There is Kelly Ripken and uh, Cal's daughter Rachel. As Cal leads it off here for the Orioles in the second inning. The Orioles down on strikes. In the first, and Cal loops one down the right field line, and it hits the chalk. Cal around first on his way for the Orioles' first extra base hit of the year. I guess if you're looking for good omens, you know, first time up, hit it down the right field line. Cal just protecting against that fastball. So you can tell when it's going to be a good year. That's right. If I had a good memory, I could tell you maybe he's right on a better year as a third baseman because <laughs> he started off better. Right on the chalk. Is your barometer what kind of season you're going to have? It's certainly <laughs> what kind of game. Some years those go just foul and some they stay just fair. I'm sure Kevin Apier's thinking the same thoughts as he faces B.J. Surhoff. Fastball taken low, ball one. Surhoff obviously would like to get him in or over. Jeffrey Hammonds, who had a terrific spring, seven home runs, 337 batting average, waits on deck. If you can't get him in, at least get him to third base and set up the sacrifice fly. Good splitter or something off speed for strike one, one and one. Well, BJ's trying to get out in front and pull the ball, hit it to the right side to advance Cal to third base. There's your Kansas City Royal defense. It needs to be a little bit better. They're talking about Offerman moving from first to second. Shortstop range. Jay Bell led the National League in fieldings last year at shortstop. Paquette, pretty good third baseman, and a lot of speed in the outfield. Jermaine Dye coming over from Atlanta. He can throw in right field. Fastball fouled away. One ball and two strikes. Sir, excuse me, five for 25 uh, in his career against Kevin Apier, 200. Try to get him over. Now you just try to make contact. And uh, we told you, Apier striking out the side in the first inning. It was command of all his pitches. Did not have a good spring. Apier with a uh, ERA of about 6.75, but did pitch well down the stretch. Slider a little low, two and two. See that shadow starting to creep up from behind home plate. One of the difficulties uh, here at Camden Yards, you start these three o'clock games. And there's a former Oriole, Richie Dower, former roommate. I don't know what you called him, but I called him Wacko. Fastball hit to the right side. So Cal will move to third, and uh, Surhoff gets the job done. Nice piece of hitting. Yeah, it doesn't go down on your bat. I mean, that's, that's an 0 for, an 0 for 1, but couldn't get him in, but did get him over. And that'll leave it up to Jeffrey Hammonds, who comes up after having an outstanding spring. Well, they know how tough a customer uh, Kevin Apier is. You can see the whole dugout up congratulating Surhoff for that job. Good slider swung on and missed. Lifetime Jeffrey Hammonds uh, off of Kevin Apier. 
three for six. Yeah, Davey was saying uh, sort of a pleasant surprise when he went over the matchup numbers or the Weaver stats. I think maybe he was toying with the, uh, the option of uh, playing Tony Tarasco, but he's 0 for 2 lifetime. And the way Jeffrey's swinging, pretty hard to sit him down at this point. Pretty hard to hit those pitches. Another great slider right on the outside corner, 0 and 2. Well, we're not sure if that shadow was a factor of this, but we know Apier's <laughs> locating <laughs> extremely well. Well, that slider doesn't a need factor. any help. Infield in for Kansas City. What happens is the ball comes in real shiny out of that sunlight and then gets very dark when it hits that shade. The most difficult time is uh, when that shadow is between home plate and the pitcher's mound. Now just... Ripken at third, 0 and 2. One out. And Hammonds goes down on strikes. Pretty good pitching. Now that's what you expect. Strikeout number four for Kevin Apier. See, it's right to where it's supposed to be, and the bottom falls out of it. One of our keys to the ball game was to lay off that fork ball down in the strike zone. Easy to say, hard to do. Yeah, Rick Down also, uh, I guess to amplify the thought you made, is that the only way you usually can do that is if Apier gets behind in the count, but that hasn't been the case today. So Chris Hoyles with a chance with Cal Ripken at third, two outs to drive in the first Oriole run of the year. It's a 255 hitter, one home run, seven RBIs this spring. Good fastball outside part of the plate, 0 and 2. We see both pitchers so far working to their strengths away for the outside corner. So far, Apier's done nothing but pepper it as Jimmy Key. 0 2 pitch. Slider hit off the end of the bat, deep left center field. And Bip Roberts runs it down. So Gala, with a double to lead it off, but the Orioles unable to score after two. Scoreless. How would you like to win the biggest jackpot from the Maryland uh, Lottery? This Friday, the big game has an estimated jackpot of $77 million. Proceeds benefit the Maryland Stadium Authority. It could be you or us. Uh, it could be. $77 million. That's it. I think we'd be making more than Albert Bell. <laughs> well, what's the odds, though? <laughs> Not as good as uh, no. the odds he has. Of course, Jermaine Dye leads it off for the Royals, and sometimes things just don't change. Bell yesterday with the White Sox, home run and a double. And they came from behind to beat the uh, Blue Jays six to five. Ruined a fine uh, outing by Pat Hennigan. Hit off the end of the bat. Bordick uh, quickly to his left, and there's one down. You had a chance to pitch with Jimmy Key up, up in Toronto. Yeah, for three years. Uh, really, I asked him, I said, how did you learn how to pitch at an early age? Because at that time, they really didn't have a pitching-rich organization. And he said he really, his uh, Clemson coach uh, just said, you know, you've got the kind of stuff, you're not going to be overpowering, you need to locate and change speeds. And he said it sort of followed him wherever he went. He started off uh, out of the bullpen in Toronto. He saved 10 games mm -hmm. his first year. He said he's got 164 uh, career wins and been around 13 years. It's 13 plus a year. Model of consistency. He faces Craig Paquette with one out here in the top of the third inning. Paquette last year released by Oakland. Came over to the Royals and led their team in home runs. Yeah, he really out of job uh, opening day. Ends up leading uh, the Royals in home runs. Always been an Oriole killer. Yeah, Bob Boone managed him when he managed in the, uh, the Triple-A ball club for Oakland. And really liked him. And last year, he did third and fourth for this club after being released. It was opening day here last season that Boone had to pinch hit for his three, four, four five hitters in the lineup. Pretty amazing stuff. Well, Bob Boone is uh, on the record as saying the last two years we've been outgunned. Very good pitching. 
Well, last year, first in uh, sacrifice bunts, first in steals, and last in runs. Trevor Lay will throw out Paquette. Once again, Jimmy Key had him reaching. He's now retired eight in a row. Well, his goal is to have them expand the strikes, and he'll throw strike one over the outside corner and just keep moving it out. As long as you're willing to expand the strike zone, so will he. New Oriole pitching coach Ray Miller, 10 years with the Pirates, seven here, managed uh, in Minnesota. As we look at Tim Spear, picked up from the Boston Red Sox, uh, played a bunch of baseball in the National League with Montreal. Good defensive catcher, had a good spring, hit three home runs, hit 309 RBIs. Using McFarland in as their catcher, another Oriole killer. Well, he's hit the three lifetime home runs off Jimmy Key, but has a, uh, what a, what are they talking about an oblique? <laughs> the injury of the 90s. Yeah, the oblique muscle. Well, Chili Davis out of the lineup, some of the punch they went mm -hmm. out to get, uh, not in this ball game. Yeah, Chili Davis uh, with a quadricep pull will be out two weeks to a month. We're going to miss him. Good changeup. One and two to Tim Spear. Yeah, they got a chance talking about the Royals to uh, be much improved last year 74 wins and 88 losses flip the side of what the Orioles were with 88 wins and 74 losses the additive inverse isn't that what that's called <laughs> maybe up in New Hampshire <laughs> curveball gets him so Jimmy Kay with his third strikeout ends the top of the third for the Royals still no score coming to you from Camden Yard. Very official hotel of the Baltimore Orioles, and I think the reason that the HTS crew and Orioles TV crew does as, as good a job as they do, which is probably the best in baseball, is because of the food the Sheridan supplies. Well, what Chris Glass saying? They can now just get us some parking, <laughs> food, parking. <laughs> That's it. In a ball game, who could ask for that? Right. Bottom of the third inning, and uh, Jeff Revelle will lead it off for the Orioles. Followed by Brady Anderson and then Mike Bordick. First three hitters scheduled to come up. Nothing, nothing. Well, Kevin Apier's thrown 28 pitches so far, 23 strikes. I would say he's on uh, on a roll. It's not too bad. <laughs> and the numbers for Jeff Revelle, not a lot of power. And the last game in Florida, a Saturday game in, in Fort Lauderdale against Montreal, won that game with a line drive single to right. That's pretty much his M.O., wouldn't you say, Mike? Oh, it was terrific. You know, so the charter waiting, and it's great timing. <laughs> Founder back up the middles, and Apier able to get a glove on it, and one down. Orioles with the only hit, Cal Ripken with a double off the chalk. And other than that, we got a pitching duel going. Well, here's this fall. So we see the front shoulder straight up in the air. If you're lucky to catch that ball, he falls off to first base so badly. Almost anything right back up the middle will get through. Second at bat for Brady Anderson, hit by a pitch. Napier got ahead of him, one and two, and then hit, came inside. And uh, Nick Brady's what? Left hand, right hand, got him somewhere. <laughs> Brady probably doesn't even know where it hit him. <laughs> Has yet to get hit 22 times last year. Has yet to rub one. No, he won't give the pitchers the satisfaction. Ryan down the left field line. The shadows are still very difficult. Now Avier almost right in the bright sun and the batter entirely in the shade. And Brady breaks his bat. We'll go back and get a new one. Well, Brady just had a marvelous season last year. I don't know if he can duplicate those numbers or not it was a marvelous season with leadoff home runs set a record 12 for leading off the game major league record was held by Bobby Bonds I think one of the things uh, he talked about that he was most proud of uh, this is a very homer friendly ballpark great hitting park here at Cannon Yards but of the 50 home runs only 19 here he had 31 on the road so he I mean a bona fide Leadoff guy with power. If he gets on, he can steal a base. Well, the Orioles had a team as a team hit 136 road homers out of their 257, so they hit more on the road than they did at home. 
Rick down on the right side of the screen along with the Oriole manager Davey Johnson. One ball two strike pitch to Brady Anderson line in the left field. So Brady now one for one here in 97. Been on base twice. Well, when you face a good pitcher, Mike, a lot of times you take what he gives you. And with two strikes, that's pretty much for that type of pitch what you can do. Well, that's a nice piece of hitting. And also, maybe with this injury, he probably doesn't feel he can overswing on every pitch. It looks like he's just trying to hit the ball to left field on this. Stay right down on it. Choked up. So it looks like he's looking to go that way with two strikes. That'll bring up Mike Bordick, the Orioles shortstop. He lays off the slider, another good pitch, but just missed off the outside corner. Bordick struck out his first time on a slider. Another breaking pitch for a strike. One ball and one strike. One out, no score, bottom of the third inning. And close just in case. I mean, normal circumstances, this is a running situation, but with the broken rib, I'm not sure that's the case. Well, Apier's not sure. Into foul territory, San Falazo knocks it down. One ball and two strikes. Yeah, Apier's been around long enough that he knows that he better pay attention because this could be a very low scoring affair. If we look at first base coach John Stearns. Brady Anderson at first with one out here in the bottom of the third inning. Rafael Palmero on deck. Fastball hit the shortstop. Dive by Bell and they get Brady Anderson at second. Outstanding play. Great play. There's Jay Bell over with the Pirates on AfterTurf. Still had the most assists in baseball, 484. And the man who hit it to him was second with 474. Just a great play. Good agility, snap throw, and you get the second out. Well, Brady, that ball most likely, if it got by Bell, it could have had an opportunity to go to third base. So that brings up Rafael Palmero for the second time. He struck out his first time with two outs here in the bottom of the third inning. Rafi uh, with a, as he always has, a off-season conditioning program. A little bit different as he lines one into right field. Bordick around second all the way to third on the throw that almost gets away from the third baseman Potkett. So Palmero now one for two. Nine for his last 18 in spring training and the hot streak just continues. No question about it. With Bordick being held on at first base, Robbie knows if he can pull the ball. It's a pretty good hole over there. Bordick with two outs just scoots right over into third base. Will totally misses the cutoff, man. Rocky there going, I should have went to second base, is what he's saying. So that'll bring up Eric Davis down on strikes as Apier struck out the side in the first after he hit Brady Anderson to lead off the game. There's a book on Eric Davis that, uh, you know, I'm talking to Hal McRae, talking to Bobby Cox, manager of the National. Uh, league champions last year, the Atlantic Braves, is good breaking ball hitter. Loves the ball out over the plate and down, but has trouble with a fastball, as a lot of guys do, up and in. Well, that, that's my point there, is if they can throw, you know, up and in fastballs all day long to every hitter, you'll probably be pretty successful, but 
the best ones they usually take and then you end up going two and oh now where you throw it breaking ball looked like a strike but uh uh, and Denkiger didn't think so. That's what I tried to watch in spring training. If it's that glaring a weakness, you would think these National League teams that played the Orioles in the spring would have exploited it. I didn't see it happen. Mm -hmm. And that's a basic uh, scouting report for any power hitter. High slider, but he swings through it. One ball and one strike. Yeah, Eric, I talked to him yesterday, and I said, or actually the day before, and I, I said, you know, I talked to Hal McRae, talked to a bunch of people, that if you stay healthy, they all said you're going to help this ball club because you can steal, you can hit for power, and, and so forth. But I said, they do say that sometimes you have trouble with a high pitch. He said, well, when I'm not seeing the ball well, I swing it. And, and that's the key. Lay off that pitch. Splitter hit the third. Off cap. Looked like it may have pulled Jeff King off the bag, but uh, the first base umpire, John Shulock, didn't think so. Well, it's a bit of an in-between play for Pockett at the throw off balance. He did stay on, and at the end of three, no score from Camping Yards. We'll be back. Orioles Television Network coverage of Orioles Baseball is brought to you by Bell Atlantic Yellow Pages, where people go to buy, find, or do just about anything. By your local Honda dealer. By True Value, the official hardware store of Major League Baseball and Yards Everywhere. Looking for a best your best deal on a new or used car? Go to Mr. Nobody's Town and Country Pontiac Nissan Suzuki on Bel Air Road in Perry Hall. Get out there, see Mr. Nobody. <laughs> I call him Mr. No One. <laughs> He's there today. Is he? So get in your car, get your portable television, and get out there. Jose Offerman leads it off, top of the fourth inning. As Jimmy Key falls behind him, two and zero. Oh. Offerman lined out to left, to actually center field, hit a, a ball that uh, Jeffrey Hammond's made a nice play on, fighting the sun in the knee off the game for the Royals. Well, his first three ball count of the game. Jimmy threw just 31 pitches to go through the order. First three perfect. That's the same pitch as the one that he just called a ball. The difference is 2 0 3 3 0. Oh. <laughs> 3 0 was supposed to throw a strike. Three and two. Offerman's actually a much better hitter from the left side of the plate. He had 332 last year. This side of the plate, just 247. Five home runs, 47 RBIs last year. He said good speed, stole 24 bases. Slashes it foul down the right field line. And you remember talking to Tommy Lasorda when Offerman came up, and of course, one of those shortstops that made him over 40 errors, and they, they got him glasses. They said he didn't think that he saw the ball, but he saw that one as he lines it right back up the middle. Mike, one of the Ford Motor uh, Company's keys of the game was to stop the running attack of the uh, Royals. And Offerman with 24, Goodwin with 66, and Roberts, when healthy, can steal. But Jimmy Key, last year, they only stole two out of eight. All right, just 25% uh, that comes out to be the best in the league. And last year, this Kansas City club stole 19 of 22 against the Orioles. Goodwin at the plate stole nine out of 10 himself. But key quickly off the mound, but uh, loses the right uh, discretion. I don't think he could have gotten Offerman, who, as we said, runs real well. Well, that was no surprise to the Orioles' defense last year. Goodwin led the league with 21 sacrifices. Yeah. Orioles in at both corners, or waiting for the bunt. Well, Bob Boone playing the. Uh, the end of his career, who now is, a, of course, manager of the Royals with uh, Gene Mock. This is the little ball theory. That's an awesome, usually an indication that you're a pretty good pitcher and you have a pretty good pitcher on your hill, too. Trying to scratch for every run. And that'll bring up Vip Roberts, who grounded out to Palmero his first time up. Good fastball outside corner for strike one. No score, top of the fourth inning. 
Roberts has not had much success against Jimmy Key, just one for 12 in his career. Fastball misses inside. One ball, one strike. Oriole defense, Hammond's uh, maybe a step to right field, anticipating maybe that uh, Roberts will go that way if Key stays out over the plate. Oh, running in this situation, not out of the question. Fastball misses low and away, two and one. Many times the tough left-handed pitcher on the mound, you'll bunt him to second and try to steal him to third. Or a right-hander, you'll try to have him steal second, maybe move him over with the bunt then. But something like Jimmy Key with that great left-handed move, holding runners at first, you'll do it the other way around. There he goes. Grounder right back to Key. And they get the second out here in the fourth inning. Offerman moving on the pitch. Well, the Royals led the American League in steals last year with 190, and they start the runner, but he makes a good pitch. Well, that's part of Ray Miller's philosophy on how to slow down the running game, make him stay one pitch longer than they want to. Clearly, Offerman wanted to run earlier in the count by putting a fake spin move on, having the infielders dog them. You keep him at second base, one pitch too long for the steal. Whereas if he was able to steal third base, he would have scored on that. It also helps to have a control pitcher that can get behind and still come back and make a quality pitch deep in the count. And you can field your position. Jimmy does all those things that uh, you have to do to be a successful pitcher. Jeff King with two outs, struck out his first time up. One ball and one strike. Jimmy Key, an active uh, winning percentage leaders. He has 164 wins and 104 losses. Greg Maddox has 165 wins and 104 losses. Well, I guess Peter Angelos is lucky that uh, the key didn't ask for $11 million because that's the number of Maddox who's going to be a free agent unless he signs with the Braves. That's the number they're throwing out there. Of course, Maddox is a little bit younger. Yeah. Not coming off shoulder surgery. Fastball misses outside. Three and one. I think Mike uh, right here with, you know, in a nothing nothing game, he is picking how he wants to and who he wants to pitch to. Oh, sure. I'm sure he's looking right on deck to see who's over there. What? Track record he has against Bell on deck is just two for ten lifetime. King of power hitter. Count goes full. Three balls, two strikes, two outs, no score. The Royals with a runner at third, but two outs. He'll definitely be shooting for a corner with this. I can't guarantee if it's going to be hard or soft. There's the Honda pitching count. And King stays alive. The first inning, Jimmy Key has been in the stretch. Just the first three and straight out of the windup. Hit sharply. Cal dives to his right from his knees. And they get him. King, as we told you, good speed, stole 15. Mitchell Page, first base coach, doesn't agree with that call, but what an outstanding play by Cal Ripken. But Cal is actually leaning towards the hole, reading the pitch, and from his knees, and the Paul Merrill stretch gets him. on the road all season long by entering the Fly Southwest with the Birds sweepstakes. Send a postcard to the address on your screen and stay tuned to see if you're a Fly Southwest winner. Now here's what we were talking about. You can see Cal, this little flinch move towards the hole, and then he comes back. What it was was a fastball away, and he can see location from there. And the other part of this, you slow it down in slow motion, which we had the luxury and umpires do not. Pretty close play. Yeah, he was safe. <laughs> <laughs> You're so kind. And who leads it off but Cal Ripken? You can see the scoreboard. Royals with three hits but no runs, and the Royals with one hit and no runs. Cal with a double off the chalk his first time. 
Orioles 0 for 4 with runners in scoring position. Got a chance. It's out of here. So Cal Ripken takes one away and then puts one up on the board. Cal first pitch swinging again. This one stays in the middle of the plate. Well, now the field being pelted with baseballs. Cal gets a bad head out. About three rows up. Well, the Royals talking uh, before the game. Uh, we talked about the win. If, if anything blowing in today it's Don Denkiger will probably talk to uh, Rex Barney and ask people uh, to make some kind of announcement for Rex to uh, tell people that we don't want things like this happening <laughs> it's not only dangerous for the players but also fans do not throw items on the field you will be ejected thank you Rex Barney what a guy good call oh yeah made one mistake that was a high slider to Cal and he made him pay for it as the Orioles now lead one to nothing here in the bottom of the fourth inning Cal actually had some pretty good numbers against Apier coming in 14 for 43 but that is his first home run off Apier and 45 career at bats and a double a triple and now a dinger Talking about if this continues, that baseball's uh, continually coming on the field, they will stop the game. That brings a little bit more of a groan than the fear of ejection, I think. Going back to that thought, Kansas City hit even yesterday uh, with the high winds, and they said the wind was blowing in. The ball still carried pretty well. They love this part. I mean, they're not the pitchers, but what's not to love? Visually very pleasing. 364 and left center. That's the one part of this field that uh, sort of jumps out at me. Yeah, that's a power. 360. Yeah, pretty fair down the line. 330 actually, but seems to be more home runs go right over that sign. BJ Surhoff takes low for ball two. I mean, Mike Messina talking about you know Detroit. Uh, you know the overhangs and the power alley in left center is 365, but you have left center field to pitch to. Yeah, you don't have a field here. Yeah. No place to really go. For where you know, where you're safe, where you yeah. take a chance, you know, where you can you know, really hit one good and have it stay in the park. Even Fenway, I was talking to Jimmy Key about the same thing. At least Fenway is for what's that, 420 to center? You know, if they pull the ball, you're in trouble. But but you do have a 42 foot wall to sometimes help you out. That wasn't enough for me. <laughs> Nor am I. Nor me. <laughs> Four straight balls, close, and a little bit out of the strike zone, and Sir Hop goes to first. First walk for Kevin Apier this afternoon. I'm a big believer in Omens. First, the Ripken uh, double hitting the chalk line. I was in Toronto at the time, but if my memory serves correctly, didn't uh, rip Homer off Roger Clemens opening day in '89? I think he did. That? And they had it end up going on to have a terrific season. Well, when you compare that to the year before, where they lost their first 21, pretty good start. <laughs> that was a pretty good <laughs> Omen, too. Sure it was. <laughs> Jeffrey Hammond's up for the second time. Told you had a great spring, struck out his first time. As Napier made some great pitches with his breaking stuff, blowing away. Three right on the outside corner. That was a situation, too, with a, was a runner on third base at the time, one out. Jeffrey looking to just put the ball in play and hit it hard, but Napier made some quality pitches. Oh. There's a slider for a strike, one and one. Talked about 
about that one ripped down. It appeared that Jeffrey sort of swung at the delivery of Kevin Apier. Herky jerky, arms and legs flailing. Now Jeffrey with home runs his last three times, and he rips this one right by the third baseman Paquette. And for the first time, uh, it, it, the spring that Jeffrey Hammonds had was really what he was supposed to be about. Speed, power, average. Well, he started uh, you know, swinging the bat real well, then he went through about a two-week lull in spring training. What Davies said to end, start anticipating the ball being a strike. But he, Jeffrey was sort of feeling for the ball and waiting to see what it was before swinging at it. The ball was getting on him too quickly. So Davies said, start the bat early. And then wait and see if it's a ball. It's almost anticipating a strike, and the bat speed really picked up. Jeffrey started pulling the ball again and swinging with authority. Yeah, three home runs, as I mentioned, in the last three games. So that will bring up with runners at first and second, Chris Hoyles. He fly to left his first time. Jeff Revelay on deck. And this is where that suspension of Robbie Alomar really hurts you. That Revelay can't help the team because he can as a utility place player, but there's not many that the teams that could afford to lose Robbie yeah. Alomar and have anything close to an equal replacement. This is Revelay's first uh, opening day start in the big leagues for five years. A guy that can play the uh, shortstop position, second base, a little bit of third. One and one to Chris Hoyle. And Tim Spear will go out and maybe discuss a little bit of strategy. Bruce Keeson's also going to go off in the Royals dugout. See what you want to do here. Yeah, Bruce was uh, talking about Kevin Apier. He said he came to the spring training. And again, we're talking one of the premier right-handers in the American League. Uh, he kind of put on a little bit of bulk across his chest. Did not start out particularly well. Maybe a little heavier than uh, Bruce would have liked. But he said that was uh, intention. You know, he was trying to get bigger. Two years ago, shoulder problems in the middle of the season. So he said he's going to pace himself, have a slower spring, and then pitch very well towards the end of spring. Lost some of that bulk up in his uh, chest area. Here's your Honda pitching update. Pretty good ball to uh, actually strike to ball ratio. Two balls to Chris Hoyles. Orioles uh, lead it one nothing on the Cal Ripken home run. Runners at first and second. Nobody out here in the bottom of the fourth inning. They didn't give in. Didn't come in with that fastball. It was like Hoyles was anticipating a 2-0 fastball. Uh, when yeah. You, yeah, when you swing at that pitch, obviously you're not picking the ball yeah. up very well. Oh, you weren't looking for that pitch. I think Chris is saying it's hard enough to guess and lean back and hit Apier's fastball. I'm not sure that's what Keeson went out and told Apier. Don't give in. 2 1 pitch. There's another slider blocked nicely by the catcher, Tim Spear. I don't know, did it ever hit his glove? I think it just hit his leg. Does it matter? <laughs> Great, you know, kick save. Yeah, we do not have any. Uh, I mean, I met him a, a number of years ago. Uh, he played for Montreal and he's supposed to be an outstanding defensive catcher, but he's not in their press guide because he was acquired the last week. But good defensive catcher. Maybe he's a former hockey player. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, you look at it, he blocked it. Three and one to Chris Hoyles. Hoyles, uh, who last year ended up with a pretty decent numbers for the year, but 25 home runs, 73 RBIs, but much better the second half of the year, hitting close to 300. Yeah, you have 224 the first half, and after the break, 294. And that loads him up. It looked like a case of trying to do too much, be too fine. It appears that that Ripken home run really had an effect that Apier really hasn't thrown well. He's walked two since that. Well, the Orioles with the bases loaded. Sirhoff at third, Hammonds at second, and Chris Hoyles via the walk at first for Jeff Rebele. We hit a comebacker to Apier. The ball up the middle. Apier made a nice play. Keep it from going into center field. You can see the 19 runs scored. An RBI opportunity for Jeff. 
slider low. And if you're Davey Johnson, you got to like this because the pitch count is getting up there. There you see Keeson on the phone to the KC bullpen. They're going to get someone up, loose and throwing. What worries them is this it happened so quickly. Home run, walk, single, walk. And his base is loaded, nobody out. Napier went pinpoint control through the first three innings. He's missed badly. Randy Barris, last year with the Tigers, he's up and throwing. One-zero -oh pitch, a little bit low, two and zero. Oh. So it's almost like Kevin, uh, because of the backup slider that. That, that hung and Cal hit it for a home run has lost confidence in his stuff, and it does happen. You see, he's rather upset with himself. They're trying to get that rhythm that sometimes uh, becomes a mystery on the mound. Two balls and no strikes. Bases loaded, nobody out. Orioles up one nothing. Fourth inning. There is a strike right down the middle. Two and one. I like that in the part of uh, Rebelay too. Take a pitch, make him work. He's in trouble. Many times a hitter will feel that the pressure's on him. And really, it's on Apier. Now, you just hope that that's not the best pitch you're going to get to hit because that ball right down the chute. Two and one. There we go. Three and one. Laid off the high fastball. Well, make him sweat, make him work. <laughs> you know? Nothing better than if you're Apier to throw a 2 0 fastball over and have Rebelay hit it hard and turn double play out of it. Keep the pressure on him as long as you can. You're not going to get many opportunities to get someone like this. Because the guy looming on deck is Brady Anderson. And then you kick it over to the top of the Oriole lineup. And Napier, I'm sure, is uh, well aware of the kind of pitcher Jimmy Key is. He knows he can't give up too many. If you're now throwing 19 pitches this inning, 13 for balls. Bruce Keeson, once again on the phone, see if Randy Veras is ready and on the bullpen. Full count to Jeff Rebele. Stays alive, fouling off the high fastball. Rebele, not a lot of power. Four home runs two years ago. Last year didn't hit any in 234 at bats with the twin. I think the Crow, Terry Crowley, could have at least got him one on the board last year. <laughs> Crow likes those line drive hitters. Yeah. I mean, you really can tell he's an ex Minnesota twin player. I mean, you really can. Do all the fundamental work. Things they need to do correctly. 3 2 pitch. And he takes it high and tight. Ball four. Zerhoff will score the second Oriole run. And the wheels are coming off here in the fourth. Three base on balls. Well, Apier wants this pitch. It appears to be. Certainly above belt high in this league, that's been a ball. The emotional side of Kevin Apier certainly wanted it. That's his third walk this inning. So that brings up Brady Anderson. Mike Flanagan uh, mentioned 50 home runs last year, and to put that in perspective, I mean, that is the fourth highest total ever in the history of game by a left-handed batter. No, and also the Orioles uh, with the Seattle Mariners set a record for 11 grand slams last year. Fork ball stays low, 1-0. and You can sense a little different earlier in this game. Maybe you struck out the side in the first, had the Orioles expanding the zone, and now that he's behind in the count, you can see how much more patient, and they're making Apier work for every pitch. Brady is one for one, been hit by a pitch, lined a single in the left field. He takes two and oh. And if you're wondering how tough it is to pitch to Brady Anderson, when you know he hit 50 dogs last year, that you just don't lay this ball in there. And you'll see a, you'll see a little bit of time taken by both parties here. Apier wondering 
Well, I better just not gun this one down the minute. That guy's got 50 home runs. Braden's saying, maybe I got one good swing. This is the place to take it. 2 0 pitch. Bases loaded, 2 0 O's. And he fouls it down the left field line, 2 and 1. And the thing is that, you know, no outs. I mean, Napier has a long way to go in this inning. Left-hander Jamie Walker came over from Atlanta along with Jermaine Dye and the, the Michael Tucker deal, wasn't it? Yeah. Two-one pitch. Good eye, three and one. Oh, there are those uh, 76 walks and that on-base percentage of almost 40%. I tell you, you got to sometimes subjugate your ego for the good of the team, and I mean, that's a perfect situation there. Ball a little bit out of the strike zone. If you're real greedy, you swing at it, but you lay off, you may even get a better pitch to hit right here. No place to put Brady Anderson. Three and one. Popped up. Middle of the infield. And there's one down. Well, A.P. dodged the bullet right there. Now you say to yourself as a pitcher, if I can make one quality pitch and get Bordick to roll over and get a double play, I got a chance of getting out of this. And that's what the conversation's all about. And if your manager, Bob Boone, you've already spent one visit to the miles, so you can't go out and relay any more information to him. Bordick struck out his first time and then robbed of a base hit by Jay Bell, who made a diving grab in the hole. Well, he's 0 for 2. Bases loaded, one out. And he's out in front of the slider. Now, Rick Down said there is no reason why Mike Bordick could not hit 300 this year. Of course, Rick is pretty <laughs> much of an optimist. Rick could make me hit 300. I think he's that good. He said he, this guy's got the ability. He's made a little bit of a change in his stance. Used to be open in Oakland. He's now square to the pitcher. Short, quick stroke. Won't hit a lot of home runs. Maybe a few more than he did in Oakland, even though that's a great place to hit home runs with the fences been moved in there. But what he brings to the Orioles is a terrific defensive shortstop. And he takes low and away one and one. Got that graphic we had up an indication what kind of hitter Mike Bordick is 381 with the bases loaded. Just misses away two and one. Well, if you're totally frustrated with home plate umpire Tom Denkinger. But that's what happens early in the game. You get those pitches because you're around the corners. Here he's had a little bout of wildness. And all of a sudden, not getting that pitch. But you made a good point. One great pitch, maybe that nasty slider down and away. You get a ground ball, you're out of the inning. But in Camden Yards, what this is all about, one bad pitch, it's 6 nothing. <laughs> you know, even to a guy that's not a home run hitter. Two balls, one strike, one out. The Orioles up by two here in the fourth, two to nothing. Two balls, two strikes. I mean, really, when you look at this inning, it's not about stuff because other than the hanging slider, they haven't hit Apier. He's just been all over the place. And Jeffrey Hammond's got a ground ball between short and third, sort of a harmless base hit. It's a three walks. And the pitch count, you have to say it all stems from the leadoff Ripken Homer. Sort of ruined Apier's game plan. What, the pitch a shutout? Yeah. Didn't you go out there thinking you're going to throw one every time? <laughs> yeah, but when you give up that one, yeah. then you hold them there. Then you hold them to two. When you give up two, you, you hold, hold them to three. Two. I mean, that's you the give way up you have five to early, you go take a shower. You go in, you, you go get them four days from now. <laughs> Cal's ruined a few guys' days over the years. Cal has a KC connection. Major League debut was against these Royals. 
August 10th, 1981. Last June 14th, he broke uh, Kinugasa's record. Did you pitch against Kinugasa in the World in Japan? No. I did. You did? Uh, yeah, that was it. Last uh, June 14th in Kansas City, we had him up in the booth. He was great. Broke the world record of 2002-16. Just keeps marching along. He broke Belanger's opening day start record last year by a shortstop. The only one remaining is Brooks Robinson's 20 consecutive. Two balls and two strikes. Still one out, bottom of the fourth inning. This has been a long inning. Bases are loaded. And there's still only one out. Slider popped up. And just out of play. Another reason it's so difficult to pitch here at Camden Yards. Not a lot of foul territory. Kevin Apier, 41 pitches in the first three innings. And we said that a lot of things have been going on here. 31 pitches this inning. A total of 72 pitches. Now he's in a mostly throwing spring training as around 100. We figure uh, not destined to go more than five or six if he gets out of this. Once again, the 2 2 pitch fouled away. The other thing is, if you're going to make Jimmy Key sit in the dugout for 20, 25 minutes, you want to at least put four or five runs mm -hmm. up on there to make it worth the wait. Well, the Orioles last year third in runs scored with 949, which is the most they've ever scored as we take a look at Jimmy Key. But I think a lot of times looking back at those games, did score a lot of runs, but you know, a situation where you could have put a few more on and make it that much easier to pitch. Off the fist. Third baseman Paquette. And now there are two outs. So just when you think maybe you'll wiggle off the hook, who comes to the plate? Rafael Palmero. He has struck out and single. Time situations like this, Rafi likes to jump on that first fastball. And he gets a slider for ball one. Hammond's at third. Chris Hoyle's at second. And down at first, Jeff Rebelet. Orioles leading 2-0, two, two outs. For Palmero, Davy Johnson looking on. There's a strike inside part of the plate. It looked like Rafi was looking out over the plate, and that's where the target was. The ball cut back to the inside corner. Well, it looks like Apier still has good velocity, still has good movement. You see Spear move out to the outside corner, and he throws it on the black inside. Many times you won't get that pitch. 1-1 one, one pitch. Slider misses high 2-1. and one. Well, I'm here, Kevin Apier said, do I dare throw it again? I'm sure Rafi 2-1 count realizing Apier doesn't want to go 3-1. And really back himself into the corner. He'll be looking for a fastball out over. And starting the bat early. Slider catches the outside corner two and two. And that's why Rafi yeah. took it. You know, this has really been an ebb and flow at bat. Apier falls behind, makes a tough pitch, gets back in even. And he's run it all the way now to two two. This is probably Apier's chance right here. He's him not giving in. I'm not sure if that was the slider or the fork ball. 
but all the way through this count. And if a word to swing the three to the advantage again goes back to Paul Merrill. Now, if you're one of those guys is not very predictable. This guy's a 81 and 48 over his last 129 decisions for a second division club and a club that finished last last year. Pretty good numbers. Yeah, 30 games over 500 lifetime. Very impressive. 2 2, bases loaded, two outs. And he goes down on strikes. So Apier throws a bunch of pitches, but escapes, giving up only two runs. One coming on the leadoff home run by Cal Ripken. 2 0 O's as we go to the fifth. The upcoming Oriole game sponsored by Hoover. Tomorrow night, 7 30, Kansas City. We'll play their second game of this series. And then next uh, week, Friday at 8.30, the Orioles, oh, actually this Friday, the Orioles at Texas Ranger. Mike Flanagan and I will be down there. And uh, the Orioles at Texas Rangers on Saturday at 8.30. Rangers last year, an outstanding year. And uh, we welcome to the booth. Governor Glenn Denning, nice to have you with you. Well, thank you. What bring, how's everything in Annapolis? <laughs> Everything's in Annapolis is just fine. In fact, uh, we've got five days left in the session. And... Uh, I actually had the speaker of the house call and say, is it okay if you could go to the game? And I said, yes, provided we pass the package tomorrow. Do you guys really do work down there? Oh, we do work down <laughs> there. The, uh, the exciting thing is that tonight we're going to go over and dedicate the Cal Ripken uh, Museum. And uh, that'll be a nice addition over there in Aberdeen. Jay Bell grounds out to Mike Bordick. So you're going up to, to Aberdeen? Going up to Aberdeen. And, uh, you know, originally the opening day was going to be yesterday. Yes, and, we uh, heard about the that. the dedication <laughs> of the museum today. <laughs> and we were all, we were all excited. Now, is Cal going to be there tonight? Uh, no, he's going to be right here playing because well, I have to leave here soon. So if if you see all of a sudden he's off the, uh, the lineup, you know what has happened. Okay, yeah. you can give him a ride. <laughs> right. Joe Vitiello. Orioles up two to nothing. Line drive, tough play. Davis unable to come up with it. It'll take one hop on the ground rule double. Tough sunfield here, especially afternoon games, Flanny. I think that's exactly what happened. The, the most difficult field, the, certainly to play in this ballpark, is right field. Especially in those low liners. Take another look. Fighting the sun all the way. Just over the outstretched glove. That'll bring up Jermaine Dye. All seriously, Governor, you, obviously you're an Oriole fan. Do you have an opportunity to come out to Camden Yards very often? Uh, I do, and I guess I do maybe uh, 15 games a year. Uh, yeah, really, really enjoy it. I'm anticipating more because I'm going to be at every playoff right through the World Series this year. So we like optimism on opening day. Ball two as uh, Die takes low. Die, Jermaine uh, last year, 12 home runs with the Atlanta Braves. Got some World Series action. Did not have a good playoff for World Series, but Bob Boone says this kid can play. On two occasions in the minors, 22 assists from the outfield. He can throw. He takes outside ball three. Seriously, how, how's everything going down in Annapolis? You like being governor? I'm I do. I love it. It's a good job. Everyone ought to do it at least once in their life. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's exciting. A lot of people try. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the exciting thing is, I mean, the Constitution requires you to uh, be here and root for the home team. Oh, does it? Oh, yes, yes. And now, you're not like one of those Monday... You know, Monday morning quarterbacks and all that. You don't ever second-guess <laughs> Davey Johnson, do you? One of my former teammates. Uh, I've got to tell you, you know, we do up here, so you can be honest. <laughs> there, you know, there really is these uh, these uh, temptations to do so, but uh, I think if there's anyone uh, sympathetic to a manager, it's got to be a governor. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so, because we get the Monday morning quarterback. <laughs> do. You have that down there. Uh, we do. So nothing's changed over the years. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Jermaine Die walking, first walk by Jimmy Key. And see how Apier felt about his inning. He's checking something uh, with his thumb. He split it open. He threw about 175 pitches that inning. Wasn't he holding <laughs> his left hand? What's his left? He's going to come out throwing lefty right. this inning. I thought about that. 
Runners at first and second for the Royals. For Craig Paquette. And we talked, <clears throat> excuse me, many times, you know, with Jimmy Key has been sitting over there 20, 25 minutes waiting for Apier to finish his duties, and looks like he may have stiffened up a little bit. Many times you like that game to go quickly. Again, if you're going to sit 15, 20 minutes, let's put a four or five spot up there. Bounder back up the middle. He will go. And they get the double play. All right. Marvelous play. The governor liked it. All right. He knocked it down, right. turned to Bordick. Bordick with that snap throw. Paquette doesn't run well. We'll be back next inning. We like that, don't we? We absolutely, absolutely great. Back with some Helix Health uh, scoreboard. No score for Minnesota. Seattle or Oakland because those games haven't started. Same in Anaheim. Uh, the Cubs will be down in Florida tonight. The Cards in Montreal. In Colorado and Cincinnati. Atlanta and Houston in the Mets in San Diego. And the Phillies out there with the Dodgers. How about Kurt Schilling? 11 strikeouts. Not a bad outing right out of the chute. That's, that's the way to do it. Trying to negotiate a three-year contract with the Phillies. And he pitches a marvelous game as we do a little bit of... Uh, we call this groundskeeping, landscaping. Well, you get the feeling that maybe April certainly have to, you have to request this, that it's digging out. He threw a lot of pitches last inning and said he's a sort of a violent uh, delivery. Chews out a pretty big hole. And if you come in and say something about it, well, you know, let's go. Let's we'll get it fixed. I'm going to talk to a groundskeeper here at Camden Yard, Paul Zawaska, and he was saying the field probably in the best shape it's ever been opening day, at least uh, aesthetically. Always in good uh, shape as far as playing wise, but because of the mild winter. Yeah, he said he was at, well, elated at how this field looks. You don't hear that too often of the ground crew. You know, many times they're a little upset with one aspect or another, but it just beautiful uh, condition, Camden Yards. Good luck of the pitching rubber. What? Uh, hey, you can see many times you line up. This is a great shot, toe to toe to the plate. In other words, it's right toe of a beers and then that should be a straight line to the play you see his foot opens up towards first base you see he sort of lands and digs out and that's where that hole comes from his foot normally would be landing probably a foot to the left on your screen to be a straight line to the plate yeah, a lot of times if I mean, at least I know when I pitch I would actually draw a dirt line especially in the bullpen to see where your landing foot is you see he's working on the side of that hole he's, he feels it's not flat. I tell you, many times, and Jimmy Key throws out of the other side of the rubber, so what may be happening, they're both throwing in the same landing hole, even though Jimmy throws from the extreme other side of that rubber. Newcomer Eric Davis for the third time up. You see, he struck out and grounded out. Eric last year with Cincinnati after taking the entire 95 season off had a marvelous year 287 with 26 home runs and 83 RBIs. I don't think much can be said to the Orioles in some ways will miss Bobby Bonilla because of the offense 28 home runs what 117 RBIs but Eric Davis in the National League with bigger parks hit two less home runs and about 160 less at bats. He slashes one to third. Uh, Kemp over to King, one out. I think you're right, and I think also that uh, you know his attitude and certainly his defense will make up for a couple of home runs and a few RBIs. I think in this park, Eric will, will thrive. Here's that great play Cal made earlier, saving a run, and then as poetic just it has it, leading off the next half with a homer. One man wrecking crew today. Two for two, double and a home run. And he lays off the low fastball. One ball, no strikes. Three for three. Could be a gapper. That ball smoked into the gap. Cal around first. And well, let's see. Three times up. Eight total bases. Yeah. 
Three for three, batting a thousand. A slugging percentage somewhere about uh, what? 1,667. Right, and you figure 600 at bats, he's going to end up with 200 homers and uh, 400 doubles. <laughs> <laughs> this ball smoked to left field. You know, it's funny, after seeing that single or the double and the homer starting up, I started thinking cycle. <laughs> but here he hits another double. Of course, Cal, the last uh, Oriole player to hit for a cycle. I don't know if it's ever been done on any opening day. Slider low to B.J. Serhoff. But he certainly has ruined Apier's uh, plan, that's for sure. He's only allowed six hits, three to Cal. Well, I guess he feels comfortable playing third. <laughs> what are you going to say? We should have done this years ago. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Certainly a lot less pressure on Cal at third base. Not in on every cutoff and relay. Uh, you can see he still uh, uses the signs for some of his positioning. I think he's going to have a marvelous year with the bat. Not because of what's happened so far. I just think there's less involved. Uh, well, you know, I had Davey Johnson in an article uh, on the so, day before opening day, or actually yesterday that was supposed to be opening day, talking about when he came over last year, almost everybody went to Cal with their problems. and. You know that that can become very debilitating when you're trying to play every day and, and do your job. And uh, Davey kind of likened it to the situation when he went first went over to Cincinnati. Barry Larkin, most valuable player the year before, and people were going to him, and he said, "Like, let me manage. You play short, and just do the things you're capable of doing." And maybe Cal will have that kind of year this year. And by the same token, we're not implying that Cal was running the club but when you go through three or four different managers and you go through three or four different po uh, pitching coaches and training staffs they're going to go to each other and Cal has been here you know for so long 16th uh, opening day it's, it's a natural thing it's not something he assumed uh, or wanted to take over slider inside if you're one of that call this is the part of the order that gave him trouble last inning. And he's doing it again. So up back-to-back walks and back-to-back -back innings. Again, we said Apier style. He doesn't give in. His stuff is certainly a power pitcher, but he can drop three, two, fork balls and sliders in a minute. And he said, you know, again, that's that situation you talked about. Spear sitting away. That ball looked like it caught the plate. I mean, you have two different styles of pitches. You both have two pitches that are very successful, but Jimmy Key, the kind that tries to conserve pitches and, Ape and not really give in, and Apier, uh, by the same token, will run deep in the count, throw all his pitches. So different styles. Jeffrey Hammonds struck out. We'll look again at Randy Barris up for the second time and then singled his last time at a ground ball by the third baseman in the left field. Orioles leading at two to nothing. We're in the bottom of the fifth inning. One out. Cal Ripken at second. B.J. Surhoff at first. You know, I think another thing, if you're Don Deckinger behind home plate, a lot easier to call balls and strike with Jimmy Key because he pitches to one side of the plate much more consistently. Well, you're right. I mean, and if he sits outside, most likely the pitch is going to be there. AP has that tough fork ball and slider. Good hitting count for Jeffrey Hammonds. Two and zero. Oh. Let's see if uh, he gets the green light. Real pitch. Good fastball right at the knees. Mentioned the Orioles leading this game 2 0. Kansas City today 0 for 3 and runners in scoring position. The Orioles 0 for 7. <laughs> yeah, great shot of the boot. And another walk. Maybe you're walking off the mound in disgust. You can see it. The catcher, what am I doing? I can't figure this out. 
first words out of his mouth. Well, Tim Spears said he's not going to tell him you're falling off because he's done yeah. that his whole career. But then you can't say, you know, raise your front shoulder any higher. Sometimes you just lose the feel. You can be locked in as Adrian was the first couple of innings. And then you can't find it. Yeah, and, and he's been around long enough and been good enough that's not the fear of contact where you sometimes become afraid to throw it over because of the consequences. It's just his rhythm is gone. You can read his lips. What am I doing? <laughs> Help, in other words. So Chris Hoyles. And this is that same part of the Orioles lineup that gave him trouble last inning. Hoyles flied out and walked. Chris hit last year. I remember it because it was almost the, uh, the longest game in the history. In fact, if it had been a little more of a high fly ball, it probably would have broken a record they set two weeks earlier. And again, Jamie Walker, the left-hander, up and throwing. 13 to 10, May 17th. Norm Charlton on the mound. Bases loaded. 3-2 with it. Yeah, well, I think actually it was uh, might have been 3-2. Yeah. High fly ball. Orioles win 14-13. You wonder if he's having flashbacks. One ball, one strike to Chris. Bases are loaded. Orioles up 2-0. Good pitch to hit, but just a little late. One and two. And there's your pitch count. One point he had thrown 38 strikes and 16 balls, and of course, balls and strikes getting a little bit more even. He had only thrown two, five balls for the first two innings. Napier ahead of Hoyles, one ball and two strikes. I would say he's on fumes at this point. One out. Two. Orioles who came up over to the Orioles in the uh, trade back in 1988 for Freddie Lynn and he's been here a long time. Been here for every opener. And with the Orioles uh, at the end of the year in 89. 63 bats in 90 and has been a regular pretty much ever since. I threw to him in 91. Did you throw to him? <laughs> no, it's not that old. <laughs> Slide popped up. And it's going to go out of play. Chris's best year and was 1993. 310, 29 home runs, 82 RBIs. On the five-year, $19 million contract. And trying to get off a good start. Hasn't been able to do that over the last couple of years. And he's tried all different kinds of things, different workout programs. Yeah, this spring spent most of the spring trying to hit the ball the other way, stay on the baseball. That's when he starts pulling off, as most hitters, he gets in trouble. Two balls and two strikes. Yeah, when it's all said and done, though, it usually ends up with 20 to 25 homers and around 80 RBIs or better. I'd like to put together a good first and second half. 2-2 Two -two pitch. And it's a good one. Kevin Apier's sixth strikeout of the afternoon to go along with five base on balls. They're now two outs. With the second baseman Jeff Rebelay. Well, again, being ahead, Royals has to expand the zone. Almost like two different pitchers when he's ahead and when he's behind. 
Outstanding stuff. Three outstanding pitches. Four fastball, fork ball, and that slider. If he falls behind, you get to eliminate the fork ball and the slider pretty much. Jeff has been up twice, bounced out, and walked. Seems like he's pitched most of this game with the bases loaded. <laughs> I didn't like that. One ball pitch. One and one. Well, a lot of times in when you pitch against a guy like Jimmy Key who is pitching extremely well has only given up two hits in the first uh, five innings that forces you to be a little finer. You figure you just don't want to make a mistake but uh, maybe you're I'm going to go back after dinner tonight and go, well, you know, I have pretty good stuff. I probably should have been a little more aggressive. Now, how do you think guys felt pitching against you all those years? <laughs> I don't know. If I give up one, I lose. That's Two not a good one. feeling. That's the thing. I'm sure he knows. Uh, he read the paper, knows Jimmy Key's uh, track record opening day. It's one of the things I've always admired about Jimmy Key, like, even when we were teammates in Toronto. Bring on Roger Clemens. And that was Roger in his prime. I mean, he just has that competitive nature. Well, that's one of the responsibilities of an open day pitcher. Popped up right side. Should be playable. And it is. Jeff King ends the Oriole fifth inning. They load him up again, but unable to score. They lead 2 nothing as we go to the sixth inning here at Camden Yards. Here comes the big one. Play the Maryland's lottery's biggest jackpot in history. Friday's estimated jackpot for the big game is $77 million. Proceeds benefit the Maryland Stadium Authority. Remember, it could be us. Be me. And you. <laughs> it could be me. Remember that. I got to guess. I know the answer to that. It's you, bro. No, it's not. It it's isn't? Jeff Ballard in 1991. No. Would you make what you... Yeah. I pitched in that game. And I pitched in that game in 91. I really that was the last uh, home opener at uh, Memorial Stadium. Wide right at the shortstop. Bordick knocks it down. Nice play. And he throws out Tim Spear, the Royals catcher. I didn't mean to jump the gun on the answer right there, though. It's all right. You know, get all hyped up. You're an analyst. <laughs> I was overanalyzing, though. Second baseman, Jose. Key is keeping it in front and picking it up the first time. No, Key's pitching. Oh. The key has been key so far. <laughs> Certainly is. Even when he makes a mistake, ball in the middle of the plate, somebody picks him up defensively. I mean, he was right on the money. One of the barometers for a, a good inning is usually 12 pitches an inning. He's right on through 5, 60. That was his 61st pitch. One of Ray Miller's philosophy, too, is see how many first pitch outs you can get on the way to five innings. And on the ground to Mike Porter. Low oh. throw, and it gets by Palmero. Offerman with a big turn will go to second. And so what seemed uh, was going to be a routine play doesn't turn out to be that. There will be an error on the shortstop, Mike Porter. Oh, Jimmy gets to hit him on the ground again. Didn't appear to rush it, just threw it low. Uh, seemed to get Ralphie right in the left knee. The thing was, he had so much time after the last one he had when he had no time at all and had to rush. And brings up the center fielder, Tom Goodwin. Goodwin is flied to left and sacrificed. And there's the strike. Jimmy Key last year with great success against left-handers. Take a look at Cal. We've seen Cal do this when uh, Goodwin, certainly a threat to bunt, we mentioned uh, led the league in sacrifices. Ooh, and he drills Goodwin right in the ribs. 
Talking about last year, 168 did left-handers hit Jimmy Key. And that's the last thing he wanted to do. That puts more speed on the base pass. And the thing, it seems like the Orioles are further ahead than they are in this game. It's still just a two-to-nothing ball game. So this ball just took ball off. And that ball's in the middle of the batter's box. What happens is you sometimes concentrate a little bit too much on holding that runner in second base, pick up the catcher a little late, and the ball takes off. So Bip Roberts will step to the plate for his third time up. He is grounded to first and then grounded right back to Jimmy Key. Runners at first and second. They represent the tying runs for Kansas City as the Orioles lead this game 2-0. You're right, Mike, the Orioles with uh, 10 left on base through the first five innings. Well, this is also a running situation. We saw it earlier in the ball game. Again, uh, Offerman at second base and Jeff Rebele is going to come in. They're going to talk about how much do you want us to hold Offerman close at second? Or how close do you want him to be? And certainly great speed at first base is over 100 stolen bases last year on the base paths. So it puts a lot of pressure on your defense. You can see it short and second. They had to shorten up some. Paul Merrill's in it closely behind Goodwin. Rip even with the bag at third. One ball is pitched to Roberts. It stays low, 2-0. It just seemed like Jimmy was just cruising along. Well, two long innings that you mentioned. That not a lot to show for him. Two in the fourth, and then uh, again a long inning in the fifth. And then no uh, runs put on the board by the Orioles. Good hitting situation for Bip Roberts. That may get some action up in the Oriole bullpen. Nobody up until this point. Well, all of a sudden, it just turned the heat on Jimmy Key. He'd really been cruising along and pitching the majority of this ball game from the windup. And there also were at a point where you're into your three, four, and five, maybe sixth hitter. There's a strike. Three and one. Up to this room. That was an interesting count right here, too. You can see the runners peering over at Richie Dower, ex Oriole third base coach. Situation if you're a manager, do I put them in motion as a control pitcher on the mound? They stay. Grounder through the right side. Hofferman will score. All the way to third is Goodwin. And the Royals get on the board and very much back into this game. And a little hopper off the end of the bat by Bip Roberts. Good hitting, though. It's really been the error that opened the door, and certainly the hit batsman didn't help. First baseman, Jeff King. See Palmero trying to scoot back a few steps to get it. And just perfect placement on the part of Roberts. So that brings up the cleanup hitter, Jeff King. Jeff has struck out and bounced to Cal Ripken at third. 0 for 2. And puts the tying run 90 feet away at third base. In the presence of Tom Goodwin. Exceptional speed. Roberts also speedy at first. And the curveball, one of the few that Jimmy Key has thrown this afternoon, ripped foul. King like last year 30 home runs 111 RBIs Mike Flanagan told you early not that this situation warrants it but three grand slams terrific offensive year the key right here is to hold Roberts close at first and have a chance to throw that ground ball double play so he will be paying extra attention to Roberts in the ways if you're a pitcher do to check on that runner, how big a lead he is, is that cutout. You see that sort of half horseshoe and Roberts out on it. Use an indication of a, an above average lead. And give your team a chance to turn a double play. Obviously much more difficult to run at second. Get deep and far to left field. Sirhoff goes back and he will record the second out as Goodwin 
tags up and makes it two to two. Well, BJ put a great deep on me. I thought it was up in the seats. Well, we mentioned that the, the few times the wind seems to be blowing in here at Camden Yards. I don't know, Mike. I thought that was a changeup that he got up in the strike zone, and it looked to me that King may have hit his first home run of the year. Well, usually you see the bat head out in this ballpark usually means home run. So the score now tied 2-2. And that brings up Jay Bell, the shortstop. Pip Roberts with good speed at first with two outs. And I would assume he's going to go. So does Jimmy Key. Well, Bob Boone, the, or the Royals manager, talking about Chris Hoyles, his delivery. You know, not a great throwing arm, even though he did throw better this spring. A little bit slow to second base. Key tough to run on. And that base hit off the glove of Cal Ripken in the left field. The Royals now at first and second with two outs here in the top of the sixth inning. Well, Plenty, you were a pitching coach two years ago. When a guy gets a little bit wild, gets the ball up in the strike zone, what does that tell you? Well, is he, to me, in this situation, he was, uh, I'm not saying overly concerned with the running game, but certainly paying at least 50 50 attention to it. I think that you try to be quick to the plate. Sometimes the ball comes up in the strike zone. But it's more of a case of putting uh, the Kansas City running game, putting some pressure on Jimmy. It's about the only thing that Bob Boone could do over the last couple of years with not much power. This year, combination of both. And Davy Johnson, the manager of the Orioles, out to talk to Chris Hoyles and Jimmy Key. Well, first he's going to go out and find out how Jimmy Key feels, and then you can see him even ask Chris, you know, does he look pretty good to you? He seems to be giving Jimmy the option at this point. The thing is that the Vidiello has good numbers against Jimmy Key. Two for four today coming in with a homer and one for two today with a double. And he struck out his first time, but hit a ball that... Uh, short hop the fence or actually went into the stands in right field a ball that Eric Davis uh, didn't get a good read on because of the sun so he comes up with runners at first and second Roberts with good speed at second Bell at first two 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 outs top of the sixth inning and he's coming off a great spring where he had almost 500 with five home runs and 15 RBIs you see Jimmy starting him off with a straight changeup. Well, I still remember that quote from Bob Boone when he was catching. He said, a lot of times you want to uh, try to prey on the avaricious nature of the hitter. Ooh. In other words, get get them to swing at balls, especially in clutch situations. And this is exactly what G Jimmy Key, you know, he's been around the block a few times. Why throw a strike unless you have to? Well, again, it's uh, maybe experience against inexperience. But he uh, realized the situation at hand. He knows he's had pretty good success uh, against Jimmy Key. Wants to get it done. Jimmy Wiley enough to say, I, I know what you're trying to do. I'm not going to make a mistake. You won't get anything in the middle of the plate. You're going to have to expand the strike zone to do it. And he did. So Jimmy Key with a clutch strikeout of Joe Vidiello. It's all tied as the Orioles come up in the bottom of the sixth inning from Camden Yards. Today's contested in the Pepsi Big Slam home run derby inning is Sandy Kerfam of Waynesboro, Maryland. If a Baltimore Oriole player hits any home run uh, during today's Pepsi Big Slam inning, Sandy will win a case of Pepsi and $100. To enter the Pepsi Big Slam home run derby inning, send a postcard to the address on your screen. Jimmy Key. Let's see, talking with Scott Cam and Nicky. Picking his brain, what were you thinking? Scott Kamenicki will be the Orioles starting pitcher tomorrow night. And the Royals make a pitching change. As the youngster acquired along with Jermaine Dye from Atlanta, Jamie Wright will make his major league debut. And say Walker, this is the first time uh, pitching at the major league level. And I'm sure one of his roles out of the bullpen is to get left-handers out. He's going to face a couple uh, this inning for sure. 
Kevin Apier threw 106 pitches. We figured right around the 100 limit for him. 63 strikes. Boy, did he dodge the bullet. I was going to say he threw 40 balls the last two innings. But when he had to make good pitches, he was able to do that. Got out of and uh, extricated himself from some jams. So Walker faces Brady Anderson. Who's Keeson telling us uh, Walker not even in the press guide because he was acquired so late. Fastball changeup. A little bit of a breaking ball, but even Bruce has only seen him pitch one time. So I'm saying if he didn't know him real well, how are we <laughs> yeah. supposed to know him real well? <laughs> Fastball top down the first baseline. Brady Anderson. Great play, but he forgot the ball. Yeah, the phantom tag. Okay, you run the Brady Anderson, uh, you're going to feel something. I think Brady sort of crunched that right shoulder. Tried to make it. Grab the ball and sweep tag. And this is fresh out of spring training. Play they work on hours and hours. It's a tough read for the first baseman. Is he going to get to the ball or not? Actually tries to barehand it. Very memorable play if it's your first one in the major leagues. You'll watch it. He tries to grab it with his bare hand and then tag him with the glove hand. Miguel Rod Hendricks was famous for that play. See the bare hand and then tag with the glove. Yeah, it's the only play he can make. Yeah, you know, you're right. You'd usually you say, you know, I got it, you take it. But a lot of times on those swinging bunts, you don't really know if you have it and he's going to take it. Well, the thing they teach now is that really for the pitcher to go get the ball, really say nothing. And if you can't get to it, take the base. It looks like the wrist of the, I thought he, uh, Brady sh Spike may have actually hit him on the right, the, the right elbow. They're checking the wrist. He may have jammed it into the base. Let's take a look and see if we can uh, we'll check the glove hand. What ends up happening with that? It looks like it's bent back. And they will give Brady a base hit. Tell you, Brady's been on the ground a couple of times. He's had a slide at second base. It's a sort of play we've actually seen Brady in the past do a head first dive. Not good for the ribs or the rib. But better than, yeah, certainly sliding on all out a la Superman. It's funny, usually a man will ask, well, is it your left hand or your right hand? You hurt your right hand. No big deal. You can still throw, right? We'll have somebody catch it for you on the way back. So you may have some difficulty catching the throw back from the catcher that shouldn't have any difficulty uh, pitching. You know, Jamie Walker saying uh, to Tim Spear, take a little off. Walker was a starter his first three years in the minor leagues and in 95 went to the bullpen. Oh, he is very much uh, like Mike Johnson. He was a Rule 5 draft, and was drafted for $50,000 out of the Houston Astros organization by the Braves. Braves looking for left-handed uh, relief help. So if, and in the trade, if Kansas City wants to keep Walker, they have to keep him on the Major League roster. Count as one of their 25 players the entire season. Let's take a look at the uh, Southwest Airlines game summary. Cal Ripken having a great afternoon. Three for three, two doubles and a solo home run. That put the Orioles on the board. Jimmy Key, you can see the numbers. Hurt by the error by Mike Bordick uh, uh, just last inning. Once again, the Orioles, even though Kevin Apier, very tough customer, 10 left on base, 0 for 9 with runners in scoring position. Short sound, Mike Bordick. If you're doing what all great pitchers do, which is when you do get runners in scoring position, turning it up a notch, even though I'm sure he struggled more than he would like. Well, many times, no situations, bases loaded, no outs, and one out. Now, you're almost going to concede a run or two for an out, and he really didn't do that. So Mike Bordick, second, actually make it fourth time up. He struck out, grounded out, and popped the third base. Let's see what kind of strategy Davey Johnson uses. Probably pretty good. It'd probably make Walker field the ball again. 
<laughs> uh, well, why not? Why not? See, both managers really playing. I say little ball, but certainly trying to play for one all the time. Davey's been also known to switch off and put a hit and run on. Talking with uh, Rick Down, the hitting coach, he's really not a big fan of the hit and run. He said it's a steal, but you really don't get a good jump and a pitcher that's really not sure he's going to get a good pitch. So let's not give him any free outs. Let's make them earn each and every one. More of your sacrifice. Jeff King quickly over to Opperman. I think Walker was putting the down and out on that one. He as far away from the play as possible. Well, it's not a bad idea when you're in your major, major League debut. Let's defer to the guys that know what they're doing. Put the heat on. Fundamentally sound, Mike Bordick. See Walker just get out of the way of the play. As the everyday players would say, let the athletes have it. Get out of the way. So Rafael Palmero comes up with one out. 2-2 two -two ball game. Bottom of the sixth inning. The Orioles with two runs in the fourth. And the Royals with two unearned runs in the top of the sixth inning. As Jamie writes, a breaking ball that... Skeezin described it as something between a curveball and a slider. Looks very sharp, though. You can see where it'd be tough on left-handers. Though I don't know if he's ever seen a left-hander like Paul Merrill. This is the sort of pitch that Rafi will lean back on a left-hander ahead in the count. Pretty good swing there. He's a little upset with himself. Rafi yelled. One for three as we once again look at Randy Bear's third time up. How many, how many pitches has he thrown? What's his pitch count? And Bruce Keeson will come out and talk. See, Barris is like what my job was my first year in the big leagues when you were pitching and you'd start to struggle. We would get me up to scare you into pitching better. Well, that's still one of the great stories of, you know, and maybe I guess about how Earl Weaver could get players that he could relate to and he understood and they understood him. Went up to Davy Leonard, who was my first roommate, who was from Baltimore and, uh, in 1971. We were playing the Pirates and came back, I, I guess, uh, about the sixth and seventh game. And Earl asked Davy how you feel, and Davy said, Earl, you never asked me that. <laughs> and he said, he said, well, can you get up and throw today? And, you know, Davy said, well, you know, why? And he said, well, you know, I want you, you know, I want you to, to use you to scare him. And he said, well, what do you mean to scare him? He said, you know, if they've scouted us like we've scouted them, me getting up is not going to scare, uh, you know, Clemente and Stargell and those guys. He said, no, I mean Palmer, we, you know, McNally and Quayle, that's who you're going to scare. So I know what you're talking about. And Davey just laughed. Just happy to be on the club. Yeah, I thought I had a chance of getting in the game. I had no chance. They're going to take you out. Brady Anderson second, two balls, one strike to Rafael Palmero, one out, 2-2 two -two here in the sixth inning. Well, you think the advantage is, uh, you know, you get a young guy like Walker, no scouting report on him, drops off a 2-1, real good breaking ball outside corner. That, I think it's hit more, more important that Bruce Keeson knew what Paul Merrill can do in that situation. You can see he went out to talk to him and said, look, if you go 2-0, 2-1, don't give in and just throw this guy a fastball. And you can see right there, 2-1 breaking ball. He's probably going to get another one. And he does, 2-2. Two and two. I mean, I really think if he throws him a fastball, it will just be for show. And you can see that after Keeson left, he also dropped down his low sidearm as he possibly could to gain whatever advantage there. Well, the Braves with the uh, probably the most outstanding pitching staff must know something. They draft this guy. Maybe they get him to Atlanta and make him even better. Again, the 2 2 pitch. In fact, Rafi was much more comfortable with that breaking ball. He's seen a number of them miss at bat. 
Well, the type of guy that just because you're left-handed doesn't mean you're going to get him out. You hang a breaking ball, get that fastball too much into play, he becomes one heck of a hitter, even against left-handed pitching. 3-2 pitch. He really dropped down, and Jeff King will take the roller for the second out. And Brady moves to third. And most likely with Eric Davis, right hand hitter coming to play, we'll have a pitching change. It's now time for the Bell Atlantic call to the bullpen. Camden Yards is the place to be in April when the Orioles battle the Royals, Rangers, Twins, White Sox, and Red Sox. Tickets are now available at Orioles box office, all Ticketmaster locations, and the numbers on your screen. Orioles baseball, there's nothing like a day or night at the yard. New pitcher for Bob Boone's Royals, Randy Barris, last year pitching with the Tigers. He was in uh, 25 games. Numbers. Yeah, and he pitched uh, for the Florida Marlins a lot the year before. He was in 47 games. Used primarily as a middle long reliever of this role. And a little more success with the uh, Marlins than he did with the Tigers last year, but maybe it's probably contagious. As a yeah, he started off real, real well. He struck out 28 batters in his first 30 and a third inning. And it wasn't until uh, later on he went to the save it was June 13. He didn't really pitch it again for the rest of the year. But I wouldn't have wanted to rush back to that Tiger team no. myself last year. Buddy Bell would call the bullpen. They wouldn't answer the phone. <laughs> Brady, and, yeah, Brady Anderson at uh, third with two outs for Eric Davis. And the breaking ball from Randy Barris. And I'm sure they'll have a left-hander up behind Barris. And they do, Jason Huckabee. And you sort of take a look on deck. Well, let's see in this situation. Uh, Cal's on deck. He's three for three, two doubles and a homer. Tough situation right here. One ball offering to Eric Davis. And the slider. Been a little low. Two and up. Oh. Eric Davis a couple of years ago played for the Tigers, but bothered by that herniated disc in his neck. Hit under 200. Did hit a home run off the ivy here. Maybe the longest ball hit here, or at least one of them. Hmm. On that fastball, but fouls it off. Two and one. And I didn't realize Eric uh, was as big as he was. He said he did a lot of weightlifting over the last year. Big guy, very muscular upper body. He's powerful. 2 1 pitch. 2 2. Bottom of the sixth inning. Royal still looking for a, a guy that can deliver with runners in scoring position, and Eric Davis does just that. Easily into second with a stand up double. Three to two, Orioles. Clutch hitting from Eric Davis, and we talked about is that fastball in. You see how quick the bat is. Pulls the hands in. It's a bullet down the line, and easily scampers into second base. I tell you, Randy Barris. A lot of times, you you know, Mike, you know, you read off how a guy reacts to your previous pitch. When he was on that 2-0 fastball, it's time to do something differently. We tried to come in with it, and Ed just did a great job of pulling those hands in right at the bat. Cal Ripken steps to the plate, three for three. Double, home run, double. And uh, a spectacular play to save a run at third base. Eric Davis at second with two outs. The Orioles now lead at three to two, bottom of the sixth inning. Slider. In foul territory. Two strikes to count. Great 
point steal ratio last year. Eric Davis, 23 of 32. Wouldn't expect him to go in this situation. No left-hander in the bullpen and Sir Hoff on deck. You see a fastball from Berres. He's probably going to waste it. It seems in his mind uh, his best pitch is his breaking ball. Yet to be able to get it over though. I think he felt he was ahead. I think he'll bounce a couple. One ball and two strikes to Cal Ripken. On the same uh, note, Cal's aware of that. Another breaking ball. Two balls and two strikes. Nice job by Tim Spear knocking it down. Well, this will be an interesting pitch also. Will he stay with the breaking ball? He's thrown him four straight. You have first base open. This is what Barris is thinking about. Oh, they try to sneak that fastball by me. Slider hit hard, but foul. Now, you were a pitching coach. I mean, here's a situation where if you're Randy Varish, you know if you walk Cal Ripken, you're out of the game. Which may not entirely be a bad thing. No, you're right. <laughs> I mean, but to, to, do you talk to your pitchers about saying, "Lay"? Hey, sometimes in situations, tight ball game, three to two, you, you sometimes have to be a little bit more careful and maybe defer to the next guy than to say, "Okay, I'm just going to throw him a strike." Well, I'd certainly like my highest location pitch at this point, not take a chance to just keep spinning him out there. Hmm. Did not get the call on that uh, fastball. To see Spear move in. I think. I, I think what happens and many times you go out to tell a pitcher look pitch around this guy and leave. Well he doesn't really know what that means. I think what he thinks is well throw them all breaking balls. That must be pitching around. But a hitter like Cal can sense that too and will sit on that breaking ball. Full count to Cal Ripken. Davis back at second base. Rick Reed the second base umpire there to make the call. In other words, and I'm saying Barris may think in his mind right here, I'm not going to give in so I'm going to throw him a breaking ball. And Cal, seeing the way he's pitched his entire bat, may be sitting on a breaking ball. Yeah, Cal, more than anybody, sits on that uh, two-strike breaking ball on occasion. 3-2 pitch. And there it was. He lays off it. And you could just see how he approached it. That was up in the zone. I'm sure he had a good swing at it. So that will bring up B.J. Serha, and that will bring Bob Moon once again out to the mound. And Cal continues his perfect day. After these commercial words. Orioles games are best enjoyed in the company of friends and family. Plan your group outing to Camden Yards by calling the Orioles Group Sales Department at 410-685-9800. Orioles baseball, there's nothing like a day or night at the yard. Other pitching chains, Jason uh, Giacomi, left-handed, on to face the left-hander BJ Serhoff. Well, 6'1", 185 pounds, 26 years of age. Seems like he's been around for a while. Remember when he came up with the Mets? The starter sort of burst onto the scene, but he's now been relegated to, I guess, this sort of role in the bullpen. Late inning left-handed batter specialist. Yeah, B.J. Serhoff won for 10 lifetime off of Hockamy, so that's why he's in. Yep. Percentage baseball. Royals still very much in this game. They trail at three to two. We're in the bottom of the sixth. And there's a little slider that misses outside. Takami last year pitched uh, pretty well out of the bullpen. 0 and 3 with a 247 earned run average. That's good fastball, but high. I mean, a big difference between being a starter and a reliever. I mean. The opposition obviously gets to stack its lineup against you. When you pitch out of the bullpen, the manager gets to pick when you're going to pitch. Yeah. Much easier to, to wean your way and have success through the bullpen. 2-0 pitch to B.J. Serhoff. 
Good fastball outside corner for a strike two and one. And Bruce Keeson saying that uh, he likes the matchups one time through the lineup with uh, Hockamy. Early on maybe two times but the third time pretty uh, pretty easy to read. I think that's the, in the modern game that's where you end up. That's sort of anyone that's in middle relief is usually one one time around is about it which is you know if you get three innings out of bullpen and middle relief you've done a nice job. If your stuff is uh, if you're missing some velocity or maybe a trip pitch uh, from being a starter which how come he is three one pitch three and two. Year, as we look at Sorhoff with Hammonds on deck, right handers hit 374 against Hockamy. And lefties, they don't have anybody up in the bullpen. Yeah, and lefties hit 271. So this is sort of the bullpen or the cards that Bob Boone has been dealt. 3 2, two outs. The Orioles have added a run here in the sixth to go ahead 3 to 2. Eric Davis at second with two outs, and Cal Ripken at first. Three two pitch. Bounce right to the second baseman Jose Offerman. So the Orioles take a three two lead. We're going to have a pitching change as uh, it appears that Alan Mills will come in to pitch the seventh for the Orioles. A pregame party at Camden Yards is a great way to start off any Orioles game. The Orioles party facilities offer a variety of options for your entertainment needs, including game tickets. So book your party today by calling 410-685-9800. Remember, remember this, Flanny Orioles baseball. There's nothing like a day at the yard. But don't come here in the day if it's a night game. And what is this called right now, though? Isn't this twilight? This is, yeah. Let's start looking for hail bop again. Already, Alan Mills comes on to pitch for the Orioles. Probably wondering what kind of spring he had. Well, you were there all spring, Flanny. Wasn't a real good spring. 15 hits in uh, 12 innings, four walks, nine runs, and uh, 11 strikeouts. Well, he was sort of working on, a, not sort of, I mean, he was working on a, a BP fastball and a curveball and some experimenting with some other things. One of the luxuries uh, of having, I guess, job security. But the last couple of weeks down there, real serious, the old Alan Mills, and uh, responded quite well. Dr. Death. <laughs> he gets the scowl. Had a terrific year last year. Over the last five years, right-handers have hit just 203 against Allen. Fourth best in the major leagues, and he's behind Hideo Nomo, Eric Plunk, and Ken Sanders. So it shows you how tough he has been on righties. Die a little bit late on the fastball. Jermaine Die up for the uh, third time. He's walked the last time up and bounced to short. This is the sort of game I think Davey Johnson and Pat Gillick and the rest of the organization had in mind this winter to sort of build the club for. Feels they're very well armed. You see, Roscoe is also up and throwing. You have three left handers, three quality right handers in the bullpen with a one run lead. And their job now is to make it stand up. And if your team scores a couple more runs, it's a bonus. But this is the, the exact game that they were planning for. And if you win, you do what the Yankees did last year, which was almost they were unbeatable in the seventh, eighth, and ninth. And that's the whole goal. You scratch a few runs, and if you can make it stand up with your pitching. And if you score a lot of runs, then it really stands up. Some <laughs> easy games. Well, Mills tough against righties. First three scheduled hitters, Jermaine Dye, Craig Paquette, and then the uh, catcher, Tim Spear, who may be pinch hit for, which is probably why we got a Roscoe up in the bullpen. In fact, definitely why. Slider outside, two and two. Yeah, I was talking to Allen the other day in Fort Lauderdale, and, uh, you know, he said, when am I going to get that intensity? And I said, well, you know, that's part of it, as you mentioned, part of, uh, as you said, have the club made and you get to work on stuff. I said, but... When the bell rings, opening day. Hopefully he'll be able to turn it on. 2-2 two, two pitch. Slider a little bit low, 3-2. and two.
Here's Ray Miller. Pitching coach. When you're pitching coach, you feel like you pitch every game. <laughs> I can see the look in Ray's eyes. He's pitching right now, too. Oh. Well, the high rider. Well, a year ago, Alan Mills question marks about whether his arm would ever be as good as it was after the <laughs> the surgery. And there. On the heck of your and, speed gun. And something just happened on that 97. Richie Bansell is heading out to the mound. Uh, and the home plate umpire Don Denkinger heading out there also. Some may have uh, scared Allen many times on one pitch. Obviously that 97. And part of it has to do with adrenaline and he's letting him know how he feels at the moment. You can see Allen signal for Richie to come out. Something obviously not right. And Davey's going to decipher the information that's being given. And we saw that radar gun flash up 97 many times uh, overextending, maybe a little bit of extra adrenaline. You can see Allen's reaction. He sort of pulls that shoulder back. They may give him a chance to throw a couple and see if it's still there, whatever he felt. Shaking, yes, but something obviously put a scare and Allen had shoulder surgery a couple of years ago and I always said after you had surgery your ears get really big because you're always listening for what's going on in that shoulder and you realize that you know that this game is a, a very fragile uh, existence your one really major injury of having everything taken away I think most pitchers live with that after they've been through a major surgery. Yeah, I never, uh, till I did it up in uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, actually threw a pitch and heard something pop, and you really don't know. Yeah, you think you're invincible until that first one comes through, and it's a reality check. I've always said you, you get over the injury much quicker physically than you do mentally. Fastball, a little bit low. Craig Paquette up. And he has bounced to a second and hit into a double play. Nice play by a pitcher Jimmy Key knocked it down and they turned the double play from one to six to three. Last pitch at 94. So they said maybe 94 under control is a little <laughs> bit better. I mean if you go back to the situation it's three two batter starting off the in uh, the inning. You, know, you don't want to walk him so as a pitcher say well I'm coming down the middle of the plate with everything I have. And obviously something went on in the course of that pitch. Now Allen back under control. Popcat, a home run hitter last year with 22, which led the uh, Royals. Hey. Another good fastball, good movement outside corner. It appeared last year as Allen came back from that arm injury, learned to pitch more with his slider, and rely more on location than just power. And then his arm came back. Pretty good combination. One ball and two strikes. Puckett does have a home run off Allen Mills. Well, he can hit him. You, you know, you mentioned that uh, he feasted on Oriole pitching. He talking about. I said, didn't you hit two in one game? He said, yeah, one off of Mills. And I re really forget who the other one. Actually, it was uh, Sid Fernandez. Mel Sid. Goodbye. I wanted it. The big change in Paquette. You can see the open stance, and he has moved off the plate. Used to be able to pound him hard inside. Opened up that front leg. Always liked the ball. You see, sort of taking away that disadvantage of the inside corner. And now, as a pitcher, you can't tell if he's diving to the outside or he's going to stay put. Popped up. The second baseman uh, Jeff Revelle is there, fighting off the sun that at this time of day filters through the stands here at Camden Yards. You see, Chris Hoyle is taking a little journey by Allen to say, "You okay?" It sure looks like it. And they're going to continue the conversation. What? Why? Am I not throwing well? <laughs> you know, you start getting in those conversations. Attention, please. Well, the Royals will pinch hit with a uh, guy that we saw for many years with the Boston Red Sox and that is Scott Cooper last year played over uh, in Japan and David Johnson 
will come out to the mound. And he will make a pitching change. So as Alan Mills departs, we'll step away for this commercial work, and we'll be back. Jim Palmer, Mike Flanagan, top of the seventh. The Orioles uh, lead at three to two. And uh, as most pitchers, they, they have a superstition, and Mike Flanagan had a chance to talk to Jesse Orozco about his. Um, I used to have, I used to be crazy, but uh, I really cut down a lot, but I still have. Well, what were uh, some of them? Oh, the, the, you know, the sanitaries, uh, the I mean, jersey Stepping top, on the line or the. The line, I still do that. <laughs> uh, a couple you step on I, it or step over it? Step over it. Okay. Uh, I'll never touch this chalk line. When I get on the mound, I, don't, I can't stand rosin, so any of you hitters, if you run across a dime or something, don't throw the rosin on the mound. <laughs> But uh, I kick the rosin off the off the dirt when I get ready to pitch. Out, and I have a thing where if I kick it a second time, I feel like I messed up. <laughs> you gotta I, get it right the first time. I got I gotta kick it hard enough to get it off the mound. And I I kicked up a couple times. I kicked them and kicked them all the way to second base. No part of, What are you doing? I'm like, hey hey hey. I got a thing out here. I do. Well, they got the onside kick down. Yeah, it's clean. And Jesse Orozco will face Mike Sweeney, who pinch hits for Scott Cooper, who pinch hit for Tim Spear. <laughs> I got you. Or actually, yeah, he was supposed to, but didn't. Well, the amazing thing is Scott Cooper was four for seven off Jeff Jesse Lifetime, 571, but matchup more important, lefty righty. You no, know, you bring a rookie, a guy, uh, Mike Sweeney, uh, as we look at Alan Mills, with a little conversation with the, the head trainer. Richie Van Sells of the Orioles. Well, he's asking him to give, or give me the symptoms. You know, what did you feel? Did you hear something? Uh, yeah, Ray Miller a little bit all more ears too. Yeah. yeah. Well, they want to know what's going on. We're here to help you. And uh, Jesse hitting that hole that uh, they did some work on. Now three and zero to Mike Sweeney. And mm -hmm. that was the most difficult thing for me coming in on the bullpen was not getting used to having a fresh, clean mound as you do as when you're a starter. You know, the things you have to get used to. Yeah, Sweeney a home run hitter on the uh, roster because of the injury to Chili Davis. Uh, he's also a catcher but much better hitter. He takes three and one. Big guy last year. He played at Wichita hit 14 home runs three at Omaha and then came up with the Royals at the end of the year and hit four home runs as we look at Armando Benitez getting loose for the Orioles. Hit high and deep down the left field line. And it's foul. Well, you can see why they like this yeah. kid Sweeney so much. I mean, he helicoptered on that pitch. Well, they're going to try to teach him, uh, and of course, who better to, to help you than a guy like Bob Boone, who uh, caught in over 2,225 games, make him a better catcher. But this is what they like about him. Well, they'll find the position for this swing. If it's not behind the plate, it'll, who knows, be first base or DH. But a lot of things right with that swing. Yeah, for three and one be Roscoe behind in the uh, count. Mike Sweeney just jumped all over that fastball, but just a little bit out in front of it. Full count, two outs. Orioles still leading. They're in the top of the seventh inning, three to two. And Jesse falls down again and uh, gets underneath a slider for ball four. Well, but a lot of landscaping going on on that mound today. Well, the first two outs of this inning uh, came rather easily. Offerman now will bat from the right side. And as you mentioned, that's the much less effective side. Uh, last year, 332 hitting left handed, 247 from the right side. And I'm sure Davey had that in mind. You know, you allow yourself a little room to, to move if he does not get Sweeney out. How many hitters can I leave him in for? Assuming he probably let him go through 
good one. There is a good fastball outside corner. Jesse Orozco, marvelous year last year with the exception of uh, April. And on the 18th and 19th of April, gave up 12 earned runs in two and a thirds innings. With only gave up 21 for the year. Sort of strange circumstances uh, surrounding those outings. That's what Manny Alexander thought. Well, Armando was pitching before him and blew his uh, elbow out. And Jesse, who had pitched the day before, was not even scheduled to, to really be in the bullpen. And came in and uh, had a real rough outing. If you were to erase those two days from the season, Jesse would have had a 152 ERA. Shows you the kind of year he had. That's a new year and a fresh start. The amazing thing about Jesse Orozco is that he's been around forever. Well, turned 40 on April 21st. He's joking uh, that uh, he plans to pitch till he's 50. <laughs> yeah. That's all I want is a 10-year deal. Yeah. Did sign a two-year deal with the Orioles with an option. Good fastball catches the outside corner. One ball and two strikes. And the Royals with two runs on four hits have yet to make an error. They've left four. The Orioles three runs, eight hits, one error, and they've left 12. Ten through the first five innings. One-two pitch. And the slider hit foul. Off of an 0 for 2 lifetime against Orozco. Auberman, who started last year as the shortstop, Greg Gagney going over the Dodgers. Made five errors in his first 12 games and only hit 194, and they moved him right across the diamond. Well, they figured that maybe relieved the defensive pressure, maybe his offense would pick up, and it did. Line drive into right field. Runners at first and second. Tying run now down at second base for the Royals. Well, Jesse's gone through a couple of hitters now. I'm sure this is the last one that Davey had penciled him in for. Certainly would like him to finish off this inning. And have Amondo fresh for the next. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people at home saying, well, why did he ever take Mills out? <laughs> Well, because he obviously didn't like the Cooper Mills matchup and decided to go with uh, Orozco and whoever at that point. One of the things you do as a manager, you go over these situations and play them a couple hours before this game in your office. What will I do if this situation comes up? So you're almost programmed to what you're going to do and not let the emotional side influence your of a game like this influence your decision. Tom Goodwin, he has been up three times. He fly to left, sacrificed, and was hit by a pitch. Goodwin's 0 for 3 in his career against Orozco. One strikeout, two walks. A real defense, everybody playing a couple of steps in. Infielders, of course, with runners at second, want to knock the ball down. And he lays off the slider. Cal is still playing that sort of interesting positioning, which we really have seen no other infielder do. What he's doing, he can check the runner at second, still get the third base on a steal. He can watch real late. And Goodwin, obviously, a threat to bunt at any time. And that's about the position you have to play to throw him out on a bunt. He's got that kind of speed. Once again, lays off the slide. Two balls and one strike. 
We've seen Goodwin uh, many times, especially against a tough left-hander in this situation. Cal trying to take that away from him. Forcing him to swing at a Roscoe. Not a lot of uh, power. Only hit one home run last year. But as we mentioned before, scored a lot of runs, 80. Stole 66 bases. Had arthroscopic surgery on his shoulder. Heard it many years ago when he was in the uh, Dodger organization. In hopes of being able to throw a little bit better. 2-1 pitch. There's the slider for a strike. 2-2. Two -two. That was to get me over slider. When you throw and you just sort of guide it into the strike zone, knowing that Goodwin's going to slash at a fastball. And then what happens, you get back even. And I'm trying to think of the name that Davey calls it, the Snapdragon, is what he calls Jesse's hard sidearm breaking ball. The fans want a Snapdragon, too. 2-2 two -two pitch. Or is it first and second? Chopper, he's going to have to hurry, and Palmero does. So Jesse Orozco makes it interesting. Mills and Orozco get through the Royals seventh. The Orioles still lead it three to two. Back with the Helix Health scoreboard. And there are your scores. 8.05. 10:30, 7:30. Some high earned run averages. If you look at uh, both the American and the National League, and out in Los Angeles. Well, by not playing, they picked up a half a game on the Yankees. That's <laughs> the good news. <laughs> well, the Yankees uh, losing last night. Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, hitting two home runs, and Mike Sweeney will now catch. Jeffrey Hammond leads it off for the Orioles. The Orioles leading at three to two. Would like to add a few more insurance runs here. And Hakami from high with a fastball. Ball one. There's a strike flowing away. Jeffrey has struck out, singled, and walked. will be the fifth starter for the Royals this year but a uh, couple of injuries uh, for the Orioles obviously but uh, also for the Royals is Chili Davis their DH uh, on the disabled list also Jamie Bluma last year in closer Jeff Montgomery uh, the closer for many years in Kansas City slowly coming back from shoulder surgery throwing well so Pichardo will uh, Assume some of the role of closer, maybe uh, set up man as he did last year. Pitched over 50 times and pretty effective. Yeah, go from starter to closer. It's a pretty versatile <laughs> pitcher. <laughs> Hammond's one for four in his career against Jason Hockamy. 3 2 pitch to Jeffrey Hammonds. Well, they took something off for ball four. Well, Jeffrey on base for the third time in four attempts. Stole seven bases in spring training. Jeffrey probably the healthiest he's ever been with the Orioles. Knee reconstruction two years ago. Uh, herniated disc. That weakness in his shoulder. Trapezius problems. Chris Hoyle takes outside, ball one. There's 0 for 2 with a walk. Chris is 1 for 4 on Hockamay with a homer in his career.
Mid swing and he fouls it back. One ball, one strike. So about a year ago, Chris Oyles hitting his 100th home run. Right here at Camden Yards. Now Jack McDowell. A little bit high, two and one. Around baseball, one of our former teammates, uh, Dennis uh, Martinez, apparently is going to be the fifth starter up in Seattle. Yeah, I saw him in the dugout last night during the game, congratulating people. I think he's going to get a couple of starts in AAA. At least one. He needs a little bit more time. He'd certainly like to have his experience on that staff. And he'd like to have uh, their capability of run support. Yeah, I'm sorry. He shouldn't saw that lineup after all those years of having to pitch against those guys to be playing for them. I mean, you plug in Alex Rodriguez and then uh, Martinez and Buner and who's that other guy? Rippy guy. Yeah, that's him. And then Paul Sorrento who had a very good year for him. Dan Wilson. And they got Hammonds in a rundown and they tag him out. So Hockamy paying attention picks off Jeffrey Hammonds. The one down here in the seventh. I'm not sure that will be a caught stealing. But he did pick him off, right? See, I don't like that. I mean, he's I picked off. He That's is. a pickoff. I mean, uh, it's caught stealing only because he continued on to second base and didn't get in a rundown or didn't dive back to first. But I really think the pitcher should uh, or deserves credit for picking him off there. Spoken like a true left -hander. left hander. Yes, can't help it. Line drive up the gap into left center. Royals around first. And he steams into second with a double. That's one of the things as a manager you say, boy, that happens every time. Well, of course, you know, if you're Davey Johnson and you've just seen Jeffrey Hammonds use good decision making process in spring training, you don't figure he's going to get picked off. Figure he'll make the right decision and then this double will. You know, we'll score them. Well, you have a plan A and a plan B. The plan A is let's get Hammonds in the scoring position where just a single scores him. And things change once Hammonds is pitched off, uh, picked off or caught stealing, as they report it. That brings up Jeff Rebele. He's grounded out and popped up. As you said about Hockamy's stats, a right-handers had pretty much their way with Hockamy last year. And it's sort of showing this inning. He pitched very tentatively to Hammonds. Oil spanks him for a double. I'm sure Bob Boone would like him to have him pitch at least through Anderson. One of those tough decisions you make as a manager. A lot of note taking going on by the coaching staff. Bruce Keeson, Mitchell Page, Greg Luzinski. Pretty tough lineup in the dugout. <laughs> As coaches. Breaking ball down and in. Two and one to Revelay. Well, that's the one thing about Jay Bell, who came over from the Pirates to uh, the Orioles uh, counterpart. Rick, Rick Down trying to keep up with the Kansas City note takers. But uh, Jay Bell said, you know, we had great coaches, Jim Leland and all the, the, you know, Ray Miller and so forth in Pittsburgh, Rich Donnelly. But he said, boy, did we have some experience on the coaching staff here. And he said, if you make an out or you don't get a guy in with the bases loaded, they understand. They've done it. Good point. They're going to be more patient. It's like, yep. you know, Davey Johnson knows the seasons. It's a long year. It's 162 games, too. I think that's where the argument comes with Brady maybe sitting out a few days now because Davey sees the big picture the whole season where Brady wants to have another terrific year and help the club. And you can see both sides. One's a long view and one may be a short view. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, again, a lot of people saying the guy that's going to probably take the biggest fall in baseball is Brady because he hit 50 home runs. And, you know, no, I don't think a lot of the so-called experts think that he can do that again. But Brady, of course, wants to get every opportunity to do that. And you have to play to do that. Yep. And he walked him. For his face, three right-handers this inning, they've all reached base. I think Bob Boone would just as soon have Hawk and me get through this, but this is, again, one of those tough decisions a manager has to make. And again, uh, Hawk and me, what, uh, 
274 against lefty. Brady's two for six lifetime. Good day for Brady. A couple of base hits. A line drive to left. Infield hit. He's popped up and been hit by a pitch. And Hockamy's job out of this bullpen is really to get left-handers out. So Boone looks like he's going to give him that opportunity. This is his role on this club. He has to be able to do it. Bruce Keeson will take a run out to the mound. He was the starting pitcher for the 1979 Pittsburgh Pirates game one. Remember it well. I started against him. We got a few runs in the first, thank God. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that game. Yeah. We scored uh, five in the first and held on uh, to win 5-4. <laughs> But I did go nine. Yeah, and of course, I only got two runs in the second game. Yeah. You always got the run. Well, they knew you could pitch. They weren't oh, sure yeah. about me. Oh, yeah. You had a real off year. Hey, I used, to come in the, I used to come in the dugout, and Earl would say, hey, we're going to need a bunch tonight. How do you think I felt? <laughs> what were you, 23 and nine? Cy Young? That was it. I had an off year. Mm -hmm. Brady Anderson trying to get the Orioles a little bit uh, more of an insurance situation. You can see right there, one for 12 with six walks. Runners at first and second. The Orioles lead at three to two. We're in the bottom of the seventh inning. Keeson just giving Hockamy a little pep talk. Look, this is the guy we need you to get. Little looper. It has a chance to fall, and it does. Coyles cantering around third will score the Orioles fourth run as Brady Anderson fists one into right field for an RBI single. He winces a little bit on this pitch, but he's certainly strong enough to fight this pitch off over the infielder Offerman's head. And you can see the strong throw by Jermaine Dye, one of the reasons they, they went out and got this youngster. But Chris Hoyle's able to score that fourth run. Rebele on the single going all the way to third base. So Anderson at first, Rebele at third for Mike Bordick. And Bordic, good swing, just missed the high fastball. Well, that's four straight batters to reach base this inning against Hockamy. Well, Bob Boone with another lefty out there and uh, by the name of Glendon Rush, but also a rookie, a guy that started last year. I think the thing that ruined his game plan for today was eight. You're throwing 100 pitches in five innings. He was probably counting on at least seven out of his ace. And normally, this is a situation you'd probably see Brady Anderson attempt to steal. Up a couple of runs. Inexperienced catcher behind the plate. Stay out of a double play situation. I don't think they'll chance it with those ribs. Rafael Palmero on deck for the Orioles. What an afternoon for Cal Ripken and Brady Anderson. Well, Anderson's been on base four times. Rip's been on base four times. We've had a lot of base runners. All those base runners, and really the, the hit of the game so far is Eric Davis two out double to give him the lead. As this game stands right now, Jimmy Key, who went the first six innings, is the pitcher of record for the Orioles. Well, pretty much his game plan. Give you six quality innings. He did that. 
gave up two runs but uh, neither earned both of them scoring in the uh, top of the six after the error by Mike Bordick. Bordick two for seven lifetime off Hockenham. Fly ball to right field. Here comes Revelo. And he is out. Throw beat him. He went around Sweeney in the tag, and uh, it's almost like leapfrog. But Jermaine Dye, once again, exhibiting that strong arm from right field. Four to two Orioles after seven from Camden Yards. How would you like to win the biggest jackpot from the Maryland Lottery? Well, I would. This Friday, the big game has an estimated jackpot of $77 million. Uh, proceeds benefit the Maryland Stadium Authority. And remember, as always, Flanny, it could forget. be you. I won't forget. What would you do with $77 million? Pay a lot of taxes, probably. <laughs> It'll put me in a different bracket. Let's put it that way. A couple of changes for the <laughs> Orioles. Lenny Webster will be the Orioles' uh, backup catcher to uh, Chris Hoyles. He comes in to catch Armando Benitez. Armando with an outstanding spring training. See, last year, a year marred by uh, elbow problems, but pretty impressive numbers. No question about it. Look at the strikeouts, inning <clears throat> pitch, and the walks. Just six. Really felt he emerged in postseason play, went through a lot of adversity. Won two games in the Cleveland series. And everybody seems to focus on the Albert Bell Grand Slam, but that was the only hit he gave up in postseason well, play. Well, that's why Albert gets $11 million a year. Oh, hit right. those kind of things. Yeah. And it was a thing. That's how I called it thing. It was a thing. It was a thing. That was a good fastball to Pip Roberts to start off the eighth inning. Orioles leading it by two, four to two. And last year, pretty much a one-pitch pitcher. This year, he has a slider and a forkball he can count on. Will you kind of tell me wh when he throws when it's going to come? Okay. Yeah, Ray Miller talking about in spring training. I said, what's the big difference? He said, more sliders. Yeah, more sliders and a forkball. Trying to get on top of it. There's a fastball right on the outside edge of the plate. According to the velocity meter here at the ballpark, 95 miles an hour. There it is. 2-2. Two -two. Orioles looking for base runners. They've been out hit by the Orioles so far. As we look at that, uh, what are we calling that? I don't know. Fast. <laughs> yeah, no, I know 97 is fast. <laughs> I think he saw Alan, Alan Mills is 97 up there and said, I can throw harder than Alan. Hope he's losing it. Two balls and two strikes to Bip Roberts. Bip one for three. A couple of ground outs and a base hit. And this is sort of your pitch a decision here. You want to finish off the hitter right here, not run deeper into the count. This is sort of a hesitation on Armando's part. Not quite sure. Well, you know, when you're throwing 96, even though you've been working on the slider and the fork ball, you want to throw something you you can throw over. Because uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I never felt when I had a two-run lead that I wanted to walk somebody or go 3-2. So he goes with the fastball, probably because he really hadn't gotten either of those pitches over. I'm sure Armando has a, the adrenaline flow. That one 98 miles an hour. See, Webster said, throw it to me a little less and it'd be fine. And he did. Threw it right by Biff Roberts <laughs> to Lenny Webster. Well, the crowd ooing and eyeing. They'd love to see triple digits. We don't even know if that's uh, capable of doing that. I just hope Armando didn't see it because he may try to turn it up. Just called a line drive to the catcher. Bell tied down the middle, just overpowers Roberts. Right, better indication to the ball clearly in the glove before Roberts can get to it. And Ray Miller likes it. That's the one you can't teach, though. You know, you no. can't teach the 99-mile-an-hour 99 fastball. You can help him with the slider and forkball. 
And that's why over the last couple of years, uh, any trades, people have said, we want Benitez. And the Orioles saying, not giving up this youngster because, again, you, you just don't teach somebody to throw the ball in the upper 90s. And I give Amondo a lot of credit, that was 98, that he went out and worked on his slider and fork ball to make himself a better pitcher. Looked like a fork ball to me. And that was 88 miles per hour. Ray Miller, I, I think I said, well, you know, why so much work on the slider? He said, well, because he would get under it, and that put the pressure on the elbow, which is uh, one of the problems. And some talk that maybe he was going to have to have some ligament uh, operation last year, but throw the pitch better, you don't hurt your arm as much. Popped up. Rebele, the second baseman, out into short center field, and we have two out here in the top of the eighth inning. Jeffrey going to give him a little grief saying that, that's my territory. And that's what Eric Davis is coming over and to tell him is that's your ball. You go get it. Center fielder has a I guess like the free safety has the most rights in that outfield. Now I asked Eric Davis I said you had any problems moving from center to right because Jim I'm an outfielder. <laughs> my position <laughs> fielder. That's right. There's the slider and it bounces by the uh, catcher. Jay Bell up for the fourth time. Randy Meyer starting to scoot around. Assuming he has the ninth. All things remain the same. Mm. Well, now only 97. <laughs> well, I went to the All-Star game up in Philadelphia and they have, uh, I don't know what we're going to call this, the... Uh, when Benita was pitching, it's the uh, you know speedometer, but uh, <laughs> it was kind of you know everybody was throwing 95, 96. And there's a the slider hit into right field for a base hit. Well, just as you were talking about, that's a slider, and he got under it. That's why it stayed up in the strike zone. Yeah, I still think that uh, if you look at Armando, when you have that kind of velocity, a lot of times if you throw a slider. As you said, get under it, throw in the middle of the plate, you're doing the hitter a favor. You know, the, the, the good hitters like the, the Albert Bells and the guys that can really adjust on the fastball, you know, maybe that'll be effective. But the guys that are late on your fastball, you're doing, you're right. doing them a big, big, big favor. They're jumping out trying to hit 97, and here comes 88. Yeah, right. And Joe Vitiello trying to uh, tie this game up. Four to two Orioles. Top of the eighth inning. And the Royals with six hits and the Royals with 10. The Royals have left 13 on base, the Royals six. So Armando Benitez quickly out in front, 0 and 2. Vidiello is struck out twice and doubled. Because hitters tell you how you're thrown. I mean, they, yeah. if you're paying attention, you know where the bat head is. Pitcher doesn't need that scoreboard. Nope. And it's a little high for ball one. One and two. Probably gonna throw another slider, see if he can get it down. He certainly did down the middle, outside part of the plate. So Armando Benitez comes in to pitch the eighth for the Orioles, strikes out two of the four batters, and the Orioles still lead it four to two. The official Orioles Master Card is one of uh, baseball is one baseball card every Orioles fan should have. The uh, no annual fee card is available now by calling 888-3332 hit. So get your card today or as we get into dusk tonight. Armando Benitez, a very effective eighth inning. Rafael Palmero leads it off for the Orioles in the bottom of the eighth. Four to two, Orioles on top. Two runs uh, in the fourth for the Orioles, two runs for the Royals in the sixth to tie it up. The Orioles came back with a single run in the sixth and another one in the seventh.
rotation uh, for the Orioles tomorrow night. Scott Kamenicki will pitch against Jose Rosado. Young pitcher who pitched extremely well last year for the Royals. And then the Orioles, after the game tomorrow night, go down to Texas. Scott Erickson will be on the mound against a uh, good looking lefty, Darren Oliver. And then Bosky and Pavlik on Saturday. And uh, most likely Mike Messina against Ken Hill on Sunday. And quite a quite a series. As we all remember that series uh, last year in Texas. The you were there. Going down, I was there. Orioles were off to an 11 and 2 start and really ran into a, a buzzsaw. Yeah, they were 11 and 2 and lost that last game here against the Red Sox and then lost five more in a row. Seems like the team never recovered from, uh, uh, I think Jamie Moyer beat Mike Messina that Sunday. They had a lead and then messed up a couple of plays defensively. The really cost in the game and it took them quite some time to rebound. Good looking breaking ball to Palmero from Hockaby and Raphael down on strikes. And we will have a, another pitching change for Bob Boone. We'll be back after this commercial break. Rights to this telecast are reserved in any rebroadcast, recording, retransmission, or any other use of this telecast without the express written permission of the Baltimore Orioles and the Westinghouse Broadcasting Company is strictly prohibited. Remember that, Planning. You do that so well. I even added a couple of words. <laughs> Hippolito Pichardo last year, uh, in a bunch of games, over 50, 15 holes. Fastball slider, a little bit of a splitter. He can be tough. I mean, that's how you make that, I guess, either from you know, starter to closer. It says one thing, outstanding stuff. Well, that's a temporary closer. At least that's Bob Boone talking about until Montgomery uh, well enough to pitch in consecutive days. See a very live fastball, a lot of movement. Straight away center field. Good one back. And I don't think he got it. No. Nope. Yes, he does. Yes, he did. What a great play. I tell you, I made a play like that. I'd have a little bit more theatrics. I'd be waving that glove around. What a fine play by Tom Goodwin. Well, that's what the other players are saying to him. Hey, hold it up. Let us know if he got it or not. But it looks like he, he timed it perfectly. Teddy Kimmel that rips. Take a, a beating. But just superb timing on his part. Clearly a home run taken away. Uh, Kenny Lofton catch. Well, I don't know if it's as good as Lofton. I mean, we've seen a number of them uh, in this part. I guess Mike Devereaux comes to mind. Slider top down the third baseline off the bat of Cal Ripken. So the bottom of the eighth comes to close. Goodwin robs Davis of the Oriole fifth run. And will we see Randy Myers? We'll be back. Okay, Bob, which one? Get out your slicker, it's gonna rain. Turk Talk, always a clear forecast. Tonight at 11 on Eyewitness News, only on 13. Jim Palmer and Mike Flanagan as we uh, get ready to start the ninth inning. Randy Myers will come on to pitch for the Orioles. He'll face uh, Jermaine Main Dye, Craig Paquette, and then the catcher Mike Sweeney. Look at the numbers for Randy last year. 31 saves out of 38 opportunities, which, uh, as he uh, will point out, just around the 80 percentile that he's been uh, throughout his career. Well, he saved, uh, has tw saved 20 games now, five straight seasons. It's amazing he still has kept his uh, strikeout percentage intact. He's second only to Randy Johnson in strikeouts per nine innings. Like another thing in the press guide that talks about it became the first pitcher in history to compile 30 save seasons with five different teams. It's 
Still has a fastball, high 80s, low 90s. Sharp breaking slider, occasional straight changeup. So die Paquette and Sweeney. Royals uh, trail four to two. Need a guy on, and the next two guys up are home run hitters. Well, nothing that tricky about Myers. Real good stuff. Doesn't ever give in unless he makes a mistake. Change up slider fastball. Very rarely ever throws them any of them in the inside part of the plate or down the middle when he's on. That's his strength right there. He says what tells him to go inside is the location of the outside corner pitch. He throws a couple there. That's his, as he calls it, his information side, and the other side is his area. So when the information tells him to go in or the hitter's covering, that's when he goes in. It's like a cut fastball, and it just keeps boring in on Jermaine Dye. The Randy Myers, one batter, one strikeout. Again, away, away, and then the slider inside. You see a tie die up. Tie die? Tie die. Yes. Up. And uh, of course, Jermaine Dye is gratefully dead. Ooh. <laughs> Out of there. <laughs> well, tie, you get me in tie die and all that stuff. Marquette lines it into center field. The Bob Boone's Royals get what they want tying run at the plate. Oh, he spoke about it earlier. Puck has been an Oriole killer, and the pitch he handles best is up and out over the plate. Very level swing in that area. Puck had knowing what uh, the club needed was a base runner to bring the tying run to the plate, as you said. This is a young Sweeney who we've seen take some pretty good cuts. Yeah, he took a 3-1 fastball with the score 3-2 in the seventh and almost tied it up. Just missed the foul pole. There's a strike. Cal down at third. Uh, not really playing the line. But... Uh, just playing deep enough and uh, looking over at the line to make sure that he could still knock a ball down to his right. One ball and one strike. I said, Randy, now that you've been in the American League, this will be your second season. What's it going to be the difference? He said, rely on my own scouting reports. You know, I'd, like, no, I mean, really, I, he said, sometimes when you come into a new league, you're not that accustomed to the hitters. Two and one for Mike Sweeney. On deck, Jose Offerman. Four to two Orioles. One out here in the night. Mm. 94 mile per hour fastball up and away. Well, we've seen 99 from Mondo. We've seen 97 from Mills. 94 now from Myers. Myers is really 94 with location. Looks like a slider that kind of backed up. Almost like a cut fastball. It really wasn't his true slider. He's going to have another meeting with Lenny Webster. So now two outs in the ninth inning. Well, what he's trying to do is the back door that slider on the outside part of the plate. Have the hitter give up on it. And it almost appeared that Sweeney did and then said, well, that ball may come back and hit to the outside corner. And kind of a half-hearted swing. Well, two outs on two strikeouts. And quickly ahead of Jose Offerman. Offerman with a two-hit afternoon. Lined out and singled twice and reached on an error. Oh and two. 
Well, the last two pitches from Randy Myers, 95. So the bullpen may be in some sort of small competition for the, the board this year. Jimmy Key went the first six innings, then Alan Mills, then Jesse Orozco, then Armando Benitez in the eighth. And now one strike away from his first save of the year, Randy Myers. And he gets it. Strikes out the side. Strikes out Die. Sweeney and Offerman. And the Orioles start the season with a victory. Four to two over the Kansas City Royals. Congratulations to Judy Smith. No player hit for the cycle, but Judy has won a Sony 27-inch stereo television by playing in today's giant HDS Orioles million-dollar magic. To see if you can turn your field of dreams into a field of green, watch the Orioles on O's TV and see your local giant for details. Well, the Orioles with a successful start to the 97 uh, campaign. They beat the Royals 4-2. They out-hit them 10-7. Mike Bordick with the only Oriole error and uh, the winning pitcher Jimmy Key pitched a uh, terrific game with the first six innings Jamie Walker in his major league debut his record now 0 and 1 and Sandy um, Randy Myers not Sandy Myers but as long as you strike out the side we'll call him anything we want and Randy Myers with his first save and Cal Ripken had a terrific day with his first home run. Forty six thousand five hundred eighty eight saw the Orioles win four to two and Mike just the way you want to start the season a great formula starting pitcher that goes six innings Jimmy Key runs his record to seven and oh lifetime and openers bullpen great job gives up one hit Ripken and then uh, Brady Anderson on base four times we like it good formula Orioles baseball returns to O's TV tomorrow night at 730 when the Orioles host the Kansas City Royals once again these those fans in Baltimore can see the game on WJZ TV and that's channel 13 and in Washington on WB 50. This Orioles baseball has been a presentation of Group W and the Baltimore Orioles. Thanks for being with us.